It's time for Windows Weekly. Paul Thorat and Mary Jo Foley are here. They're not in Vegas. They're not at CES. But we will have all the CES news that relates to uh, Microsoft. We'll also talk about voice assistance and the silencing of Cortana. Plus two, not one, but two new versions of Windows 10 hitting your hard drives this week. It's all coming up next on Windows Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Windows Weekly with Paul Therott and Mary Jo Foley. Episode 603, recorded Wednesday, January 9th, 2019. A low-volume jig. Windows Weekly is brought to you by Atlassian. Atlassian software powers the full spectrum of collaboration between IT teams and the rest of your organization. Visit Atlassian.com to find out which Atlassian tools are right for your team and give their products a try for free. And by ExpressVPN. Protect your online activity today. For an extra three months free with a one-year package, go to expressvpn.com slash windows. It's time for Windows Weekly. The not at CES version, Paul Therott is here from Therott.com. Delightfully. Delightfully. <laughs> Delightfully not at CES. Mary Jo Foley is also here. They are both in their respective domiciles. Mm -hmm. I want to point out hundreds of miles away from one another, and yet through the magic of Skype, that ever so magical device, we are together. Yep. And not Bill Gates in magic Vegas. of software. <laughs> yes. Hello. Yes. Yeah, anything anything that prevents us from going to Vegas is a good thing. Anything. Common common sense. Anything. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and this year especially, see, I mean, every year we kind of say this, but it's gotten it's yeah. just nonsense. It's just there's nothing. No. So the only, well, from our perspective, there's a bunch of PCs that are announced every year. Yep. It's just one of the two times per year where basically every PC maker announces a bunch of stuff. But PCs, I don't know if you noticed, they're not exactly a new thing. Um, yeah. They're not changing a lot. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's not you know, it's not like well, oh, the great now with now with three lenses or anything. And right. It's, uh, AMD, <laughs> I guess AMD Chromebooks is a story, sort of. Yeah, sort yeah. of. If, any, if, if you're a manufacturer or any company and you want to get the word out, it seems to me CES is not the best place to do that anyway. I, no. I actually agree with that. And um, <laughs> although, you know, well, the world changes, right? So Apple obviously infamously has put up a big advertisement on a hotel in Vegas. Yeah, that was the um, whole story. That was literally the biggest story of CES. <laughs> actually, I don't think it was. Uh, I would say the biggest story of CES is that Apple is putting AirPlay and iTunes on smart TVs from a variety of manufacturers, right? So um, Apple, the company that supposedly never goes to CES, actually has a pretty big CES presence this year. Mm. Yeah. That's what uh, happens when things go south, you know? You yeah. Change. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, You know, I always uh, I have this terrible FOMO cycle that I go through, fear of missing mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. We're around December time, and I do this to poor Lisa every time. Maybe we should yep. go to CES. <laughs> and she, well, actually, is why in it's December. good, it, it's in good December. that that happens yeah. in December because that makes it hard. No, you know, I, I checked and Trump International Hotel has plenty of rooms. <laughs> Jeez. Plenty what of price rooms. your soul? Like, what do you have to like get like they cut your finger on the way in? So you can... <laughs> Omerta. No, yeah. the, uh, there are hotel rooms. They, they really jack them up. I looked at the Cosmopolitan and it goes from $188. No. $119 on Sunday night, last this past right. Sunday, right. to over $1,000 last night. Oh, man. Wow. Yeah, yep. Same room. Yeah. So Just yeah. go next week, Leo. You'll have a great time. I am, actually. <laughs> We're going to see Lady Gaga in a couple of weeks. Yeah, perfect. Oh, you are? Well. Yeah. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're staying uh, yep. down, down on the Strip, a lot cheaper. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and Gaga, well, who doesn't love Lady Gaga? So. <laughs> So it's going to be interesting because we're seeing Elton John next week. Oh, cool! Right. Yeah, his Very farewell cool. tour, and oh, then nice. uh, Lady Gaga is is in residency. I guess they call it kind of yeah. like a, un a major university. Uh, she, <laughs> a little bit. Very Can much, you audit this class? Yeah, uh, very much that like that, where they bring in you know Nobel Prize winning mm -hmm. singer songwriter, and then uh, you know she lives there for a while so the students can benefit from her <laughs> wisdom and um, sure. Uh, so we're looking forward to that. That's going to be a lot of fun. But yes. yeah, I, don't, I, I, despite the FOMO, uh, I man, Lisa managed to talk me down, 
And uh, yeah. now I'm looking at it and going, wow, uh, I'm glad. I guess I'm glad. Because what you forget, it's like having a baby, I, I hear, not having done this. But what you forget <laughs> is yes, the Leo, pain. Preach. You forget the pain of CES. The cab That's lines right. that go on for hours. <laughs> And then you're the sick every time slow. afterwards. The illness Everybody gets that sick. follows. <laughs> and, you know, they've I got guess, booths. Uh, there are people I miss seeing. Yeah, no. that's the one I like. And then we have some private meetings, especially with PC makers, that are useful. Yeah. yeah. So they're not, not essential, but not essential. But so you you skipped out of it? Uh, is that? Yeah. Yeah. I haven't gone I tried in like 10 years. Year. Really? I haven't been in ages. Yeah. yeah. I haven't been in ages either. Uh, I can't remember the last time. We used to, remember we used to spend a lot of money, have a booth. and That really was yeah. fun. Yep. Yeah. I remember doing a but segment with you over in um, South Hall. It should be South Hall. Yeah. Next to the Earthquake Subwoofer <laughs> Company. Yeah, yeah. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, We're here yeah, at CES. Cool, but... <laughs> but, yeah, it was yeah. cool, but it didn't, you know, and, 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 and it seemed like there was more there then than there is now. I mean, really, mm. honestly, I'm reading the stories thinking, Come on, know. there's something, right? It's a bunch of stories <laughs> about people who are trying to justify them being there and by mm -hmm. writing about nonsense, you know, that, yeah. and uh, obviously there's, there's going to be a handful of things that are, you know, are truly interesting for sure. But so what, um, are, what is, is, well, I actually don't want to jump the gun. Your CES story is a little bit a little yeah, there's lower. Not to say about CES. A little lower. <laughs> it's okay. Um, yeah. Did Microsoft, was, uh, they're not at CES, right? They're um, there. Yeah, um, they're, they're, they don't have a booth, uh, an official. Everybody's presence. there, like they have a suite, and you can go meet yeah. with them and stuff like that. They're Microsoft there, like, to has support always had a press room. Right? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I assume they have the same, right? So there's the yeah. the secondary hotel, um, which is I think is the Aladdin. That's not right. <laughs> Sands, I don't rub, know. Whatever. Rub it, it and so, see what happens. <laughs> uh, down in the basement of that building, they've always had a. A press room down there, so I, I didn't go this year. But I assume if you go down to the basement, uh, there, there they are, and the the giant gentleman uh, with the suit on will not let you through unless you're in the press. Right. <laughs> so um, he looks pretty serious. In fact, he looks like he might have mob connections. Um, but mm -hmm. yeah, that's how it works. They don't have a booth. Huh. <clears throat> yeah, and uh, and not much to say, I, I guess, right? It's more a show for their partners, really. Like they they're yeah. there to say, hey, we're there. To, in support of Windows 10. I guess that Phil Spencer was on the stage for the AMD keynote saying, hey, Xbox has AMD inside. Yep. Right. Huh. <laughs> that kind of stuff. And maybe the next or, Xbox yeah. will have 7 nanometer uh, AMD inside. Who, who knows? Maybe. Who knows? Who knows? I'm sure somebody knows. Somebody right. knows. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I did say today is the point. Um, right. So mm -hmm. I don't know. You know, Obviously, if Microsoft had a bigger consumer push, you would be seeing announcements like we see for Cortana. Uh, for, uh, sorry, Google Assistant and Alexa. That's really the only but, people who go there. But for now, Cortana, right? is, is Echo's uh, stuff and Google's Assistant stuff, mm -hmm. and then a lot of yeah. little case manufacturers, auto accessory guys, stereo yeah. guys. It is TVs. kind of an auto show. No? It's TVs and audio autos, really. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. Of course, uh, you know LG got some. Okay, I so cracks me up because it got pressed for the same thing they showed last year right the, the roll-up tv i remember that distinctly last year i think that the tv thing is uninteresting right now um 4k uh, you know tvs have become really inexpensive and i think that upgrade cycle has pretty much happened and tvs for to get people to upgrade again a several years are going to have to go by and B, the technology is really going to have to show up. And and yeah, the QLED, 8K, whatever. But there's no content mm -hmm. that can take advantage of this stuff. There's no bandwidth that would have let us stream uh, content of that quality. Um, I think the 4K thing was such a huge improvement, especially when you factor like HDR and some of the uh, side technologies that it's just... There's not that's much to that. say. I mean, yeah, that's yeah, that. it's kind of done. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's the industry as a whole. Okay. Yep. We're done. We did everything. <laughs> well, no, it will. It, well, yeah, it never does that. But I mean, it will. It will eventually. There will eventually be a new TV format that will be the next thing, and we can talk about TVs again. But I, I, I right now, it's like, it's like yeah. whatever. I mean, but that's true for PCs. That's true for phones. Yeah. yeah. Yep. The coolest thing I saw, I, I think it was a Verge story. I saw this and was a desk with a PC built into the desk for space constrained areas so you could like pull the monitor out from the wall and adjust it to different heights but it, all the computing power was in your desk i'm like okay that's useful for somebody like me but otherwise 
Yeah, but then you're buying, you don't. Then you have to then change you're your desk. you buying a desk. I know. I need a new desk too. So it, okay. like maybe that's why it was interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Let I me mean, tell you about a little place called Ikea. <laughs> so, <laughs> but think of having it in your desk. So then, you know, your PC is not taking up any footprint on your desk. Because it's like. Well, in a way, I mean, if you're going to talk mean, about a, tr right. a long term trend, uh, it's computing everywhere, right? So. Right. Yeah. My, my PC is built into my monitor, so it's actually not taking up any space on my desk. But your monitor is. I don't know if the desk is the best <laughs> yes. form factor for a computer. Do you? What are you looking down? No, it, the it had this thing where Rises the monitor could be raised, pulled press out, a button, and it emerges. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Okay. And wow. that's CES, ladies and gentlemen. In a nutshell. <laughs> Holy yep. camoly. More interested in smart toilets. Um, Kohler, obvious Kohler had an Alexa-powered toilet. But again, maybe I'm crazy, but I think they announced that last year. Yeah. This is, that wouldn't this, is, this is a really interesting example of an industry that's just kind of in stasis right now, or plateau right now. Everything is, though. You could pick, you pick any single thing you want. If you want to talk about, like, a smart thermometer, uh, thermostats, rather. You know, the, where's... The, there's no giant innovation coming to these things right they'll have air quality controls and you know stuff like that but i mean it it's just there there is no major new anything really when it comes to cs um there's just nothing there's there's just even if like for example if uh kindle switched over overnight to like uh color e-ink right which would be amazing yeah um but how does that change the world like does it really is it is it you know like I don't know. It's not, you know, I'm not saying it's nothing, but it's, this is, I, don't, I can't think of anything in this sphere that, yeah. unless the car is going to get off the ground and fly, you know, <laughs> that would be interesting. I was promised that as a child. When's that going to happen? Yeah. I mean, I even remember CES is where there were more exciting things like flying. I guess there's a flying car at CES this year too, but okay. Uh, okay. from the same people, <laughs> no, the same people who do. The uh, the um, what are the, what is it called the uh, 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 ostrich? No, it's not that. It's not an ostrich. <laughs> the 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 uh, HA the horizontal takeoff. Uh, Leo, vehicle. use your words. I can't. The words have <laughs> the words have left me. His gestures are good though. Me. I'm like yeah yeah yeah. I know yeah what you mean. That's too bad. No, <laughs> that thing people are only thing. listening. The thing with the the uh, horizontal uh, vertical VTOF uh, no, osprey. It's like an ostrich, only it's, no, it flies. It's like an ostrich, except there's really nothing like an ostrich. <laughs> it flies. <laughs> anyway, osprey, osprey. I don't think ostriches think. fly, by the way, I but think the, whatever. That's I right. think, no, they don't. That's the osprey does, though, because it's a VTOL. Anyway, it's not important. <laughs> <laughs> I feel, uh, no, you know what? I feel like in the past, uh, CES used to be more a visionary show. You know, like the, the keynotes were more visionary kinds of things than they are now. Now it's kind of like, here's what we have, you know, in TVs, Actually, here's what we have coming. That's what I miss. I mean, it, it makes sense that Microsoft is not part of CES anymore, frankly. And yes, we write about Microsoft. And But I think for us in particular, and people who like Microsoft care about Microsoft, it was a chance for Bill Gates in particular and later Steve Ballmer, but I like the Bill Gates stuff especially, where they would, they would talk about the future, right? Yeah. This isn't right. stuff that's going to come out this year, but... Here's a bunch of stuff we're working on, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And I I used to enjoy it for that aspect of it alone, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Um. It was kind of a neat. Uh, you felt like you were, into where their head was. You were at, participating you know? in the future. You did. Yeah. Like you're getting an inside track on here's what's really going to happen. CES is no, aggressively well, today. today. It's, it's, a, it's aggressively today. It is. It is. Yeah. And it's aggressively, or, it's about things. It's just about right. things. things. And sometimes things that never show up at all, yeah. right? <laughs> like yeah. just, those are the this best is what we're thinking about. No. Yeah. <laughs> and those articles about the things that don't exist and how much better they, they are than the things yeah. we have here today. Yeah. Uh, those are my favorite articles, you know. Like yeah. this thing, like someone heard a rumor that Samsung was going to have a pinhole something and a phone. So hit some other idiot drew a picture of it. And oh my God, this looks way better than the existing <laughs> Samsung phones. <laughs> yes, well, of course it does. It's a fantasy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they don't you know? have to make it. Yeah. Right. I mean, I. Jeez. Like th this is this is what we've turned into. I know. It's just I think, a, I think CES wasn't CES the first time Microsoft showed off the the vision for the big ass table thing, the sur the thing that was originally <laughs> the surface. The surface. Table, yeah. Right. I don't remember. I think it was. I think it was sense. there where yeah. they showed like Bill Gates putting demo. his.
they, he like put his keys down on something and it recognized. Yeah, it. yeah it was, remember that? Yeah. Yeah. We was just we just did this somewhere. We used a. Oh, in the uh, in East in Berlin, East Berlin, in Berlin, there's a, an East German museum that uses a surface table, so you can interact with artifacts from an East German house from the 70s. So when you put mm -hmm. down particular objects on the table, it does exactly what you're describing. The screen changes, and it you know gives you information about that thing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean it's it's you know, it's cool, and then it, it's and it you, your head kind of races like what could this be used for, and then eventually mm -hmm. what you realize is. It's basically going to be used by hotels in Las Vegas. Yeah. You know, and, then the odd, <laughs> yep. and then the odd museum. Yep. Yeah. Yep. It's uh, the, the folks who do the Osprey are Bell, the helicopter people. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have a concept hybrid electric air taxi. Mm -hmm. They hope to start testing mm -hmm. in early 2020. Again. I don't think I want to be one of the first no, testers. Testing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How about a smart bot? for boxing training. Oh. No. Hmm. Uh, how about the Hyundai Elevate? It walks, it climbs, it assaults Echo Base and takes so, out yeah. the shield generators. I, what? Huh? No, no, I'm <laughs> wait, sorry. Wait, wait, wait. No, no, that, that, <laughs> sorry, I lost right? my head. I'm sorry. Talk about a niche market. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just looking at the different uh, coverage. This is uh, CNET's uh, coverage of yeah and it's just it's incredible yeah, it, it, yeah it's terrible and real light mixed reality glasses uh that they hope this is look, should launch this is what later this year this is terrible because this is our jobs but let me just reduce technology <laughs> to exactly what it is we got a sous vide for christmas right yeah. and it's an interesting device my wife is an incredible cook and i gotta be honest she doesn't need this she makes steak or um, duck breast or whatever it's perfect but you know, we've been experimenting with it and it's fine, you know, but <laughs> one of the things like I cook eggs every day. Yeah. So I'm like, I'm going to use this thing. Let me see what this is like, because you can cook an egg to exactly whatever you, you want. It. You can. And uh, as long it as takes you remember 45 to minutes. put the egg in the night before. Yeah. <laughs> it's 45 minutes is what it takes. Yeah. So see you, see you at work, egg. Let me tell you something that I've mastered. <laughs> the ability to make the perfect poached egg in, Three wait for minutes. it, five minutes. <laughs> yeah. Exactly five yeah. minutes. Yeah. Yeah. And by the way, when you want to eat an egg, what you don't want to do is wait 45 minutes. Yeah, I know. Yeah. So what you really need is the sous vide that I have, the mellow sous vide. <laughs> You put the egg in the night before, and you tell yep. it when you want to eat. Uh, the time it, and it and then it kick chills the egg because it does. Yeah. It's an unusual sous vide. It's both chills and heats. Chills the egg mm. until forty five minutes before you get up. Cooks the right. egg, and then when you and wake then chills up, it again. Or does not? No, it doesn't. Because don't you want to? Isn't there? A th well, it doesn't matter. No, no. Anyway. Unlike boiling it, you can leave it in the sous vide for a while. That's right, because the right because that actually it's kills only 120 the, uh, degrees or something. It's right. really just hot, warm water. <laughs> Look, I mean, all I'm saying is five no, minutes. I'm with you, and it's perfect. I'm with you. I'm <laughs> you know, that's you. all I'm saying. That, it's yeah. the best soft boiled egg I ever had, by the way. Mm -hmm. Right. Because, but it's. Yeah. Well, sure. It was pooped out of the butt of a golden goose, and then it went into some magical <laughs> oh. machine that you're describing. Hey. <laughs> yay, yay, yay. Anyway. Were there any computers that you thought were interesting? There were a ton of computers. Were any of them interesting? Yeah. Not exactly. No. Right? Only one. Is it? One. Oh. What about okay. the Surface Studio clone from clone. Lenovo? Oh, interesting. Um, Is it a lot so less computer, expensive than my $3,000 Surface Studio? No, it's a Cheaper. bit less expensive. That's the problem. So if this thing had been fifteen hundred bucks, I think I I would I mean excitement is a bit of a strong word, yeah. but it's it's like twenty four hundred dollars. I know. But you know why it's interesting? Because Microsoft, I think, wants their OEMs to clone the Surface Studio. And so far, Dell is the only one who has, and I think they only did it as a monitor and not a full PC. It wasn't actually the same at all. They they last year at CES they had a device that laid flat on the table you could draw on and everything. And it right. was interesting in its own right. But you're right, it was not a, a Surface Studio replacement. So this is the first clone of, mm -hmm. of the Surface Studio. Clone using that word lightly, but yeah. the first no, OEM device like that's, that was the only and, thing no, I was like, right. oh, wow. And, and, <laughs> right. So for Microsoft, uh, their uh, success with Surface in many ways could be defined by the fact that other PC makers copy their designs. And that yep. in doing so, Microsoft has, in effect, created a new market, right? Yep. Now, this is never going to be a big market, but I would say, I think we could lump the Dell device into here. It was certainly inspired by Surface Studio. Mm -hmm. And now that yep. uh, Lenovo has outright copied it, uh, yeah. And I think this will 
because, you know, as it turns out, like I'm using an all-in-one computer right now that doesn't have touch. The iMac is a popular all-in-one computer that doesn't have multi-touch. But these devices are unique because you can, you know, bring them forward and write on them and, mm -hmm. or touch them if you want to. And um, there is a market for that kind of device. It's not, you know, it's not a huge market, but yeah. it's, uh, they, I, I would consider that a success for Microsoft for sure. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, though, like you were saying, iterative iterative devices, yeah. like, you know, has a new chip or it has, like, rounded yeah. corners. It, it used to have the square corners. The next version of the like, ThinkPad yeah. X1, whatever. The yeah. next version of the XPS 13. Yeah, because you knew that there was going to be a new X1 Carbon, and this, now yeah. it's here. Yeah, there always is. There every always year. is, every year. Yeah. And there, the, the, the one that was out last year wasn't round or oval. It was still the same shape. It was, wasn't yeah. orange or yeah. pink. That's it was still black. It, you know, yeah. Yeah. It's not... You know, this we're not doing major things. It's that which is fine. I, I will say this isn't necessarily CES like new to CES news, but Intel did do a demonstration of the 10 nanometer. I think it's called Ice Lake yeah. chipset, right? Well, which will appear in been, PCs. Yeah, I mean, we, this is long awaited, so that's good. Yeah, mm -hmm. this is actually going to be a big deal, but it's not going to impact the PC world fully until probably a year from now, frankly, because the the first PCs will come out in time for the holidays this year. It's not clear if those that means desktop only or laptop only. You know, we don't know yet. But you know how these these rollouts always, you know, happen over a period of time. And so, yeah. IFA probably will see some announcements in the fall. Later, we'll see releases. At CES next year, we'll see some announcements, and then in the spring next year, there'll be more. Mm -hmm. and I, it might be fifteen or eighteen months, really. But this generation is finally happening, and I do think it's going to be a big deal. It doesn't help anyone listening to this right now. You know, it's not it's not gonna <laughs> yeah. it's not gonna change the story in the next six to nine months for right. sure. Right. Did probably. Intel have a booth there? They, I guess they always still have a booth there, don't they? They I, again, I wasn't there this year, but yeah. they always have. Yeah, so. they've always had that big booth. It mm -hmm. used to be kind of across from the Microsoft booth. <clears throat> now it's yep. across and from the TCL. I think it booth. engulfed the Microsoft <laughs> booth space. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. the only reason I remember it is because it was a caddy corner booth. And it mm -hmm. had the really soft carpet. So as you yep. whizzed by it on the way to yep. the exit, trip. <laughs> you know, it would be <laughs> just like a moment of, oh, and then on. Yeah. So I, I, so I would always, uh, I, that would always make me stumble a little bit because I'm trying to cruise between people and you hit the plush carpet and it, it, it it's yeah. like quicksand, you know, you yeah, kind of. No, it's true. You like, sink right in. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. So Project Athena. Yeah, that was that also was kind of interesting. That's the name for what Intel is trying to do against Qualcomm. Basically, it's the successor to Ultrabooks, and how they are trying to make PCs more responsive, uh, better battery life, all those things that Qualcomm's doing as well. Good. Um, it's good to hear that they care. Well, <laughs> you know, it's a uh, but but five G connectivity is part of it, and oh, and, right. and therefore it's ah. it's in many ways an extension of Microsoft's always connected PC initiative. It is. Yep. which Intel has an initiative with exactly the same name, by the way. Right. Um, Microsoft is a member of this little consortium of companies, mm -hmm. by the way, which makes it interesting because that means that future Surface PCs will have 5G chips in them and will be always connected PCs. Mm -hmm. Which would be good. Yeah. Yep. I'm sorry, I'm still but thinking about Intel's carpet. <laughs> <laughs> not, about, not about poached eggs. All well, that too. <laughs> We just actually, I am now glad that I didn't go to CES because we've just received three giant boxes of meat in the uh, in the uh, foyer there. I just started, I stepped out for a second because my son texted me and said, you just got a lot of meat. <laughs> okay. 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 I thought he was I joking. That would have been, thanks, buddy. Uh, go to, a, it's not on our Instagram yet, but I uh, I did pose with the meat for a picture. Uh, our Instagram is twit.tv, twit.tv. Uh, if you want to see a, a picture of me and a, three large cases of meat, I think it's a new sponsor, actually. Man, I love it when we have a you sponsor. You don't just randomly that, get giant cases of meat? No. <laughs> No, I think uh, this is good. It's nice to have a meat sponsor. Every podcast. Hey, what about a vegetable sponsor? Oh yeah. Hey, put down pear girl. You get your you get your thing. <laughs> no, that's good. If broccoli, the broccoli association of America would <laughs> like to, or you know, to go with the meat, maybe the potato growers council. This is there what happens go. when everyone's a winner, Leo. Don't put up with this. Everyone this is, is terrorism. <laughs> no, we can have tot, tot pick of the week. Tot guys. of the week. 
Guys, there are possibilities. You know, it kills me. We had a beer sponsor. And they wouldn't advertise on Windows Weekly. I said, but all the beer drinkers listen to are Windows you Weekly. Are kidding? <laughs> no, it's was good it beer. Because I don't drink beer. Was that why? No, I don't know what it is. <laughs> I don't get it. It's very okay. odd. It's a they wine drinker, I can tell. Yeah, it looks like he's probably like <laughs> rosé slushies or something. <laughs> Anything yeah, else? Watch that episode. Any <laughs> <laughs> the rosé slushy. Yeah. Uh, are you not saying rosé slushy? Oh, man. <laughs> We'll find out about that this summer. Uh, anything else? I, I, I'm going to look at this Surface Studio clone because, you know, I use the Surface Studio very happily. I really yeah. like it. Um, it. It does it for me. I mean, that's most of it. I mean, I, I, I honestly, as just a normal consumer, I think the bigger story out of CS was the assistant stuff and all of the support uh, that you're getting from third parties. And actually, that's part of my tip, so maybe I should say that for later. But I, I think... That was bigger than the PC stuff, uh, just because it impacts so many more people, yeah. um, and is a little well. No, it's just as iterative, actually, but um, it's a, it, it's a newer thing, so this still got a little bit of a shine on it. The uh, Apple iPhone ad, you know, what stays, what happens in your iPhone stays in your iPhone, mm -hmm. actually made me think of what you had said a couple of weeks about, or maybe it was last week about Microsoft and the opportunity they have to double down on privacy, right. Um, that's that should be in a Microsoft ad too, you know. What happens on Windows stays in Windows. <laughs> well, first they're going to make that true. Well, <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, no, but yeah. that's exactly I, what they. But do. I agree with you, and I, I, when I, I had, I don't remember what made me think of this, but I was looking at some Microsoft announcement about AI, 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 and I thought to myself, you know what, people actually don't trust AI. I think for most normal people, what they think of is Skynet and the Terminator movies and how the robots are going to decide that humans mm -hmm. are the weak link and they're going to kill us all. And that maybe the last thing we need is it's not, not there are simpleton kind of things. I mean, like like what I said was genius. But, uh, you know, like worries about, you know, robots stealing jobs or AI taking away jobs and that kind of thing. Well, that's going to happen. I'm sorry. That's yeah, that already happened. Happen. It's I mean, already happened. Sure. Yeah. Um, but, but I think there's a broader concern that is – ethical in nature yeah um, and that's that's what ai yeah that's legit and it is it is legit and and microsoft i mean to their credit they they often speak of ethical ai and they have uh put forward various ideas about uh maybe formalizing what ethical AI, ai means somewhere you know sort of like the asimov you know what is it five laws of robotics or whatever um except an actual law <laughs> in real life or something <laughs> um and okay that's fine but i i think the broader thing that is maybe more important and would could take AI under its umbrella is this privacy stuff, you know? And my recommendation to Microsoft, which I wrote up, is just that they should focus on marketing privacy instead of AI, even though they will still put AI in everything, you know? Um, yeah. Part of, and, and part of the kind of, it's not that I'm suspicious of AI personally, I'm actually not really that suspicious, but when you see how Microsoft is contorting itself to make everything look like AI, and you, you can tell by the way that they release information about new products and services, how they always emphasize AI, <laughs> that this is an edict from on high. It's gone to the point where they're like, well, you know, Microsoft has been an AI pioneer since they added spell checking to Microsoft Word in 1988 or whatever. It's like, yeah, guys, <laughs> hold on a second. <laughs> that is not anything. That has nothing to do with AI. Nothing. No, and then and, it's like the boy who cried wolf, right? Like the more they do it, the more your eyes just glaze over when it is a real AI thing. Like it's like, oh yeah, more AI. Yeah. 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 But <laughs> privacy is something I think most people get and care about. Uh, not Mary Jo, as I found out I earlier know. today. But, no. <laughs> but, but, you know, it, I, but I think there's an opportunity there to do what Apple has done and is doing around privacy. And for Microsoft, I think it's a great selling point. They could yeah. do something specific like say, look, in Europe we have this GDPR thing. And it's uh, a lot of people, have com not people, but companies have claim, uh, complained about how hard it is to adhere to these rules and all of the nuances of it and where does it end and blah, blah, blah. Microsoft could just say, look, we're not going to just meet the needs of this thing. We're going to exceed them and we're going to do it everywhere, not just in Europe. You know, well, I don't know. Uh, Did you see Brad Smith's top 10 list that he put out at the start of 2019, Paul? Brad Smith, the head of yeah. Microsoft General Counsel. I, I actually don't think I did. Okay, did number one, really what privacy. I just said? Number one, oh, okay. privacy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, so I think okay. I think you're going to get your wish in part. I think they're really going to 
push more on privacy and GDPR is kind of their lead off as, as to how they're going to do right. that. Um, but he, in his list, he, he kind of conflates privacy and AI in part. He's like, you know, it would be good to do more like privacy related inf- innovation, like what we're doing with AI. And I'm like, oh, there's AI again, right? There um, is, yeah. But there's still, I, I think <laughs> I think you're going to hear from them more about okay. privacy this year. Even, you know, last year we heard a lot because of GDPR, but this year yeah. I think you're going to keep hearing more from them. Well, I mean, the Facebook stuff has kind of brought it to the public forefront, yep. right? Um, right. I, I do think it is an issue a lot of people think about all of a sudden. You know, we, we were joking earlier, Mary Jo and I, about Scott McNeely, but he had said back in, I think, the late 90s, he said, look, your privacy is over. <laughs> you got to get over this. Yep. It's, it ended. And that was 20 yeah. years ago-ish. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, if, if he was, I mean, it's, that was nothing compared to now, right? I know. I know. It I know. wasn't. <laughs> so according so to Adweek, I, Microsoft has decided to uh, create trust and empathy through its icons. Oh, God. So you could um, do it with yeah. privacy. I know, but or do icons. those icons have a privacy policy, Leo? Because <laughs> if they don't, that's baloney. <laughs> Microsoft reboots its look to better connect with consumers, aiming to create trust and empathy yes. through right. design. Yeah. You well, know, design. <laughs> no, wait, that's through a this. privacy Honestly, policy. What about that? No, but I think that that's some, these things all coexist, right? In other words, you're trying to create a relationship with your customers that is based on trust. And right. there are all kinds of different ways to do that. Um, one of them is you could stop screwing up Windows updates, by the way. But, um, <laughs> but you know, the privacy stuff is important. I think that's part of it. Uh, making your products more humanistic or whatever by making the icons prettier is a small part of it, but it is still part of it. Um, I, ju I just think it's something, uh, it, it would play to its strengths, but there, there are specific steps it would have to make with specific products. And I normally, you know, just because we c care about Windows the most pretty much and mm -hmm. we talk about this stuff a lot, I mean, there's a lot of privacy nonsense in Windows, frankly, still. Yeah. And there's a lot of complicated controls. They're all over the place in settings. They're not all in one place, even though there is a place in there called privacy. And this is something they could really clean up and finally give users the ability to just turn off the data collection. You know? Yeah. Um, just respect that happen. need of... I, 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 well, then this privacy thing I'm saying can yeah. never happen because you, you can't talk about privacy and not provide it. I know. I, I agree with you on that, but I think a part of privacy is privacy theater, right? It's it's, oh, it's making people feel like yeah. they're doing yep. everything they can about privacy. But then when you talk to them about, what, well, how about turning off telemetry or letting people who understand it to turn it off, that they never will, especially for home users. Yeah. They never will do that, right? Well, so. yeah. I, I So sadly, I actually kind of agree with you, but I still think that for that, I'm not saying turn it off. I'm saying let people turn it off. You know, in other right. words, there are different degrees to which data can be sent to Microsoft from a Windows 10 PC. And I don't, personally, I have no problem with the data that's being sent to Microsoft, assuming that my understanding of what is being sent is correct. Right. In that I feel that as a part of this community of Windows users, I can help everyone's experience be better by providing them with data that they can use to fix problems, right? It's something we should all take part in, in my opinion. However... I also respect this, the fact that some people are uh, more privacy centric, you know, sensitive or whatever. And they, they, and I just as a person, I guess I just agree that they should be able to turn that off if they don't like it. Yeah. You know, Microsoft can make it difficult, but they, they should make it possible. And right now it's not yeah. possible. Right. Yeah. Oh, well, I guess we won't see a giant <laughs> billboard next year at CES on the Marriott. <laughs> For Microsoft. Actually, you I might. Don't, you, know, you still might. I mean, I, it's a I good know. idea. Yeah. Yeah. And by yeah. the way, it's nonsense that what's on your iPhone stays in your iPhone. That's oh, yeah. crazy. Oh, yeah. Everybody was it's quick crazy. to point that out. Right. All you have to do is install an app. Your data is all over <laughs> it's the over. place. It's over. Yeah. And, and, as long as you don't open you the this, box, you're cool. Yeah, you bought this $1,000 yeah. phone not to use any of those apps. Yeah. It's not staying on the phone. Yeah. Or, or yeah. don't use iCloud. Right. The uh, difference between, you know, honestly, what Apple is selling essentially, they'll never be able to sell it this way because it kind of diminishes the message, is we are protecting you from us. We can't help you with anything else, right? Because <laughs> as soon as you install anything on there, it goes whatever. 
you know, Samsung or any of the other Android makers are like, yeah, we're not even protecting you from us, you know, yeah. but the, the degree to which you're exposed to your data is exposed to the outside world on any of those phones is roughly the same. It, it, you know, like I trust Apple, honestly, I mean, for this kind for data and, and whatever. So the, the notion that they're not even collecting my data doesn't help me in the slightest. I never thought they would ever do anything nefarious with it to begin with. What they should be protecting me against is all that other stuff. Yeah. And and I know they do to some some small degree here and there. But um, the fact is, if you want to use the Facebook app or you want to use Twitter or you want to use an email app or whatever it is, like, I'm sorry, but they all have different terms and all of them include using your data. Pretty much. Yeah. And so uh, Scott McNeely was right. Yeah. <laughs> I, I Listen, I... I I've come to understand that he was right about a lot, <laughs> actually. Yeah. Right? He was just I mean, crazy, he was, but he was right. <laughs> he was a nut, but he was kind of a lovable <laughs> nut. And he he was so anti-Microsoft at a time when, frankly, he was a little ahead of the curve, right? Because remember, they were eventually sued you know, in by the, by the U.S. government and then by the EU as well for all of the things he was complaining about. Mm -hmm. We had Scott on uh, triangulation a couple of years ago. Oh, yeah, nice. yeah. <laughs> Does he still have he's all his mellowed, teeth? Because right? I know he plays. Hard. No, he's not mellowed at all. He hasn't. <laughs> really? I thought he was nice. kind of like a little kinder, gentler. Oh Scott yeah. McNeely. I mean, I don't remember how. I mean, I he's still Scott McNeely though. He's pretty outrageous. Yeah. I I enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun. That's yeah. Cool. What What did you talk? What did you, what I was don't the remember? Talk? You know, I'm gonna have to go back and uh, look at. Yeah. It. Yeah, because I he's he's pretty much retired. He must have known oh, he yeah. had something he was investing in. I'm sure to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I mean, what? he's you know, as a going concern. Yeah, son was no, was no, long gone, done. and son is done. Uh, owned by Oracle now. That's who I'd love to interview is Larry Ellison. He's oh, smart man. though. He keeps his head down, doesn't he? <laughs> he does. Yeah, that's, that's this. You know, it's really smart. I look at people like Jeff Bezos, although he is in the society pages today. But I, I look at him in general <laughs> yeah. and say, you know, this is the way to do it. Don't be an Elon. Yeah. You know? Right. Right. No, yeah, you got to hide the crazy. No, nothing good. Yeah. No one would know Elon was crazy if it weren't for Twitter. Just put down <laughs> the freaking mic. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. stop being such stop an idiot. Stop being yeah. cuckoo. Exactly. Yep. Uh, did you want to talk, Paul, about your contest? I see that's on here. So let's yeah. oh, wait. Can contest. we do one oh, more? Wait, wait one yes. more privacy thing, guys. <laughs> one more privacy thing. Because this is huge. Oh. Oh, right. Huge. Huge. Okay. Did you guys see the story I had about? Bali, Microsoft Bali. Yes. Oh, I was going to ask you about this. This is fascinating. Yeah. Okay. So this I'm is Microsoft saying you own your data. I know. Huh. Which is everybody's trying to figure out. Okay, what? what does that why mean? are they doing this? Right. Yeah, yeah. So there's a Microsoft research project codenamed Bali, B A L I, and uh, a Twitter user named Longhorn found it, and then the walking cat made me see it, and I found the website, which has now been taken offline. But oh. um, so Bali is Microsoft testing a way to give users control of data collected about them. And it they're calling it a data bank, a personal data bank. And the bank will let users store all data, raw and inferred, generated by them so that they can visualize, manage, control, share, and monetize, which is the un unusual word here, all that data. So this is important private testing inside Microsoft right now. And obviously they aren't talking about it, but it, it kind of builds on this concept they were testing out in Microsoft Research called inverse privacy, which means um, inverse privacy says there's all this data that is yours that is held by other entities like grocery chains and even like toll road operators and all these other entities. They have this data and you don't have it. They have data about you. So the question is, how could you control, get get control back of that data and somehow do something with it? You could destroy it if you wanted mm. or monetize it or do something else with it. Just keep it. Um, monetize it. Mm. Mon I know the monetizer part is saying to me, like, how? How would you monetize that kind of data? But maybe you would right. sell it back to the vendor if they wanted it or needed it. But yeah, this so this is a very interesting project. And, you know, because it's a research project, we don't know if it'll ever become a commercial product or a service. But these days, almost everything for Microsoft Research does become a product or part of a mm. product. 
So I think this is going to be something, but exactly what and when and kind of what form it will take and why Microsoft's doing it, it's those are all questions we don't know and they're not talking right. about. I think this is great. I'm glad to hear. This is not yeah. something new. I think Tim Berners-Lee had announced a couple of months ago that mm. he was going to do something similar ah, okay. along those lines. Right, to the web, yeah. Yeah, people want, you know, this this notion, we've had people come on and recommend it, privacy advocates and so forth, that you should be able to sell your data Instead of mm -hmm. just giving it away kind of unwittingly, you should have, yeah. know what it is, what you're giving away and be able to, mm. uh, you know, say, like a look. a personal this, data market. Yeah, this is what I want yeah. for it. You know, this is what, this is what it's, uh, it's yeah, exactly. I, I, we I, wish, I need somebody like now. Microsoft I mean, to do that, I think. Somebody big. Yeah. yeah. I mean, every time, you know, you use a free Google service, you kind of have this understanding you're using some of your data. It's not explicit, but you're right. I mean, yeah. it would be nice yeah. if we were like, here. Like a here, lump sum? This is, well, no, no, no. Yeah. I, don't, I don't expect that at all. Uh, although, you know, the notion that maybe <laughs> Facebook could pay you, fifth, you know, $15 yeah. a year is what you're worth. Mm -hmm. Or maybe if you paid them $15, you they wouldn't do any marketing your mm -hmm. data, that kind exactly. of thing. But, but the, the, notion, that. the notion is that, well, okay, I go to Gmail and, and, and Google says, look, here's what we're going to use this for. Here's what we're going to collect. And this is what you get. Is this worth it? Yes mm -hmm. or no? You know, yeah. if, if so, sign up for Gmail. If not, see ya. But mm -hmm. that's not explicit. It's implicit. And I think a lot of people don't really even know yeah. that that's it's, what's This on. is the new version of the end user license agreement that no one reads. Remember right. the, mm -hmm. the outrage like when iTunes came out and it was like this 17 page document that you had to just click accept to yeah. and how quaint that is today and how I wish that's all it was. Those were um, <laughs> you know, like oh my god what if Apple finds out what songs I listen to? They're going to think I'm an 80s guy. You know. <laughs> god, what a problem to have. <laughs> Maybe I'll get a good playlist out of them. <laughs> well, or, or at least some a jacket with some nice shoulder pads. A puffy, a puffy shirt. Uh, yeah, puffy shirt. Um, so, contest. Tell us tell yes. us what the status is. This is something Chris well, Capicella laid on us last yeah, year. Yeah, so when Chris was on, right before Christmas, I guess it was, Christmas as we call it, or Chris, yes. Chris Capmas as we call it, <laughs> yes. um, he offered uh, to give, uh, well, through whatever means we could come up with, uh, Windows Weekly viewers and listeners uh, some prizes in the form of uh, Surface hardware and uh, product codes for Xbox Game Pass and for Office 365 Home. So since then, they were able to deliver the digital things to me over email, right? So I got that stuff immediately. And uh, over throughout.com, we gave that stuff away over two different times. And so the one was last week, and I think the other one was, oh, it might have been before Christmas, actually. I guess it was right before Christmas. Um, in the sense that, you know, no good deed goes unpunished. You will not be surprised to discover that I got a couple of complaints from people who were like, I uh, don't watch the show until three weeks later. And I didn't learn about this contest until it was too late to blah, 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 whatever. And I can't cure everyone's problem. But um, this one will get a few more complaints because the hardware arrived yesterday. So I have like this mountain of Microsoft hardware. And I will be doing a giveaway, the final giveaway from this event. Uh, over the next couple of days. So I want to just describe here how it's going to work. And if you listen to the show next week, I'm sorry. It's, you know, it's over. I can't really help. <laughs> um, the other bad news is that because it's hardware and it's you know, physical in nature and I have to ship it myself, um, I can't do this outside of the United States. It's too complicated and expensive, time-consuming actually as well. Um, so this is going to be for U.S. and Canada only. I'm sorry. Um we looked into this and I, I know there are people out there who are like, I would pay for that. And I, you know, thank you. I get it. It doesn't, it, you have to understand I'm, I'm actually paying for this out of pocket. It's a little more complicated. Just thank so, GDPR friends. Yeah. yeah. There you go. <laughs> I wish that's all. I wish that's all. This is, it's always been difficult. I've done my own giveaways or I've sold no, my own devices better. and things. Yeah, yeah. When it goes to Europe, it's a nightmare. It, it's just, or wherever it's usually Europe, but when it leaves the United States, it's really hard. I'm sorry. So just to recap what we have, um, we've got five uh, Surface headphones, which I think hopefully you can Ooh. see without a click. Um, ironically, none of the hardware we got I've ever been able to, ever been given for review. So it's in my house and I can't have it. Um, and <laughs> That's very honorable of you. I, I yeah, would have said, is. we have four Surface headphones exactly. to give away. <laughs> I don't need it. Um, uh, Surface Go Ooh. and the type cover. So these oh, will go nice. together. All Cantera type cover. So the good news about the Surface Go, by the way, is I was kind of wondering about this because there are different versions of it. 
Obviously, this computer is on the underpowered side, but this is the best Surface Go you can get. So it's 8 gigs of RAM and 120 gigs of storage, and that means it's SSD storage. So actually, there'll be a performance boost uh, there as well. Um, somewhat surprisingly, though, he also provided us with two of these awesome, <gasps> funny... Oh, like, man, so, you got the sweater. <laughs> sweater. Not so, available in stores. Right. So uh, there's one for me and one for Mary Jo, and I talked to her about this earlier, and we both agreed that we're going to give these away oh, as well. Oh, you're so generous. Um, so I didn't, uh, I didn't really talk to her, you, and Mary Jo, sorry, about the details of this, but I, would, I will do this as part of the hardware giveaway, if that makes sense. Sure. Yeah. Why not? Uh, unless you want to do it separately. I don't know if you wanted to do it differently. No. Yeah. Um, so here's how this is going to work. Um, I usually try to make sure this stuff is on the site for 24 hours so people have a chance to actually, you know, get their uh, entry in or whatever. So I, I will post something tomorrow. At 1 p.m. Eastern, that's Thursday, right, uh, January 10th, uh, describing what I just said. So we're giving away five each of the Surface Pro, uh, Surface Go and the Surface headphones, and then one one large and one extra large shirt. I'll explain what you have to do to enter. It's basically just have a comment with a specific phrase for each one of the things that you'd like to be entered for. And then 24 hours later, at 1 p.m. on Friday, I will close that and then announce the winners and I'll start the process of, you know, the mess of delivering this stuff to, to people. So I will finally be able to wash my hands of this. So all the rules and everything you need to know at therot, T-H-U-R-R-O-T-T dot com. Right. And, you know, you were talking about Vegas and um, I can't remember the, the way you said it, but there's this effect where you hate yourself for going there, but then the year goes by and all of a sudden you're like, oh, I could probably do, oh, childbirth, you compared it yes, to childbirth. Yes, it's like um, child <laughs> Vegas is, is like this, childbirth. It's a unique <laughs> philosophy only I have. But. Um, this, this, doing this hardware shipping thing is a lot like that Yeah, <laughs> for me. Yeah, like for I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be able to give people stuff that I know they're, they want and they're going to yeah. enjoy. The process of actually doing it for me is yeah. terrible. <laughs> So um, I'm, I'm eager for this to be over. But so, I will get it out as quickly as I can. Eric in uh, Eric Duckman in our chat room says, next week can we get somebody from Microsoft? I um, mean, he's from Apple on because he'd like to win an iPad. <laughs> <laughs> You're watching the wrong show, Eric? And no. <laughs> <laughs> nice try, though, Eric. Nice yeah. try. That's, uh, I'll, I'll, we'll... We'll we'll throw that one in the, around in the next meeting. Kick it around. We could give away notepad or something. You know? Notepad, it's all yeah. yours. Yeah. A special. I mean, deal. never say never, but a Mary Jo Foley autographed version of Notepad. Yeah. Ooh. I don't know how you would do that. I don't Send him a document with your autograph, <laughs> I guess. Someone will bring like a Kindle or a Surface device or an iPad, and then ask you to sign it. Oh, we that happened to us before. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know it's happened yeah. to me. And I, I always say it's the same reaction. It's like, are you sure? I mean, I know. You, you, might, yeah. you might someday want to sell this. <laughs> and I, I can assure you that my Sharpie signature on the back is not going to raise oh, the value. I have a solution for that. Instead of writing to the guy's name, you just write to eBay buyer. Paul yeah. Yeah. And uh, that really <laughs> solves the whole problem. Yeah. 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 All right. Let's take a break. And then... Um, Actually, we've gone through a privacy as well, haven't we? Have we done it yeah. all? Yeah. So, right, see you next week. <laughs> no, no, no. There's oh. this thing called Windows. Oh, we get more. There's a crazy little more. thing called Windows. We got to talk Pretty. about that. Before we do that, let me talk to everybody who works uh, in you know in software as an engineer in a collaborative environment. I, you probably, in fact, I know you know the name Atlassian, but let me just remind you how great Atlassian is. It's a collaboration software company that's empowering teams, including ours, all over the world, really. Uh, you know Jira, right? I mean, that is the agile platform. There's, I mean, there's, just, there's, not, there's no number two. It is the... But do you also know about Confluence and Bitbucket? We use Confluence here. We use Jira here uh, as kind of a... Um, uh, what do they call that? A pegboard for, uh, for all of the stuff that, the punch board, that, for all the stuff that needs to get done and who's responsible, the deadlines and all that. It's very handy for that. And then Confluence, we use to document our processes. And it's I think it's really important, especially with a small team like ours, that everything is documented so that the next guy can know what you did and fix whatever's broken this time around, that kind of thing. Uh, but they have, they have a whole lot more. Bitbucket, that's that's great for fixing what's broken, figuring out what's broken for reporting. Uh, they've got, uh, you know, all sorts of uh, 
uh, reporting stuff, J Jira Ops, Ops Genie status page. Look, if you're in DevOps or Agile development, if you're in IT uh, apps to Ops to ITSM, whatever's next, Atlassian, it's not just for developers. They offer an affordable, reliable suite of tools for teams of all sizes. We love it. We are totally hooked on it. And I think you will be, too. Help detect incidents better, alert response teams, coordinate response efforts to resolve issues faster, keep customers or stakeholders updated with Jira Ops, Ops Genie status page, cross-team project planning, organization, and communication, just getting the job done. We're talking Jira, we're talking Confluence, we're talking Bitbucket. Your teams can choose the tools that are right for your current framework while trusting that as you grow, they will grow with you. Atlassian is the leader when it comes to collaboration in IT. I think you are going to agree. And I tell you what, like all of Alassian's products, the tools for your IT team will be easy to learn and free to try. Very important if you go to Atlassian.com. A-T-L-A-S-S-I-A-N, Atlassian.com. Find out which Atlassian offering is right for your team. Well, I think we use them all. I think we actually have them, have them all in our uh, in our uh, stable try it lasting today and unleash your it team's potential at lassian.com i'm thrilled to have them on uh windows weekly because i know so many of you are familiar with them and use them and love them i know we do uh now let's talk windows 10 with paul and mary joe what's the what's the latest <laughs> nothing There's absolutely the well no yeah, that's a lot nothing. oh really <laughs> since the last show there have been two new builds of windows 10 wow. for the fast ring for the next version Holy right cow. so we'll get to those one second i this is 19 h1 this is moving along yeah yep. yep um actually one came out today which is kind of that's an unusual day right for builds wednesday no kind of no they wednesday. always seem to come out right before the show yeah. actually all right whatever you guys you know what <laughs> come on man <laughs> don't mean to contradict man. you paul you know, it's, come um, on so, man one inch away from dementia, it's fine. So, um, in, in last week's build, uh, there were two major positive signs uh, that I, I, are just wonderful hints for the future. Um, and they address two things that we have been complaining about uh, for a long, long time. The first one is that Windows 10 home users have no normal facility for delaying software updates of any kind. Um, there are workarounds. You can set your, you know, computer to be a metered connection or whatever, and hope nothing bad happens that you need a real update for. But um, there's no, there's no way in the software to say I don't want feature updates for X number of days. I don't want these updates for X number of days, like you can in Windows 10 Pro. But in the last build, actually, I'm not sure when this appeared. Um, I, I, I installed. I, I found out. Yeah. This is crazy. Okay. Wait till you hear this. You know when this ago. appeared? You want to hear? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this appeared it back in November. And well, none so, of us really noticed it, here, I guess. <laughs> well, not so, exactly. So here's why, though. They why? never said uh, Windows 10 Home. So wh when I went to go install Windows, um, yeah. the Windows 10 inside, inside a preview on a bunch of computers, because, you know, I've been working on the book and I want to you know keep right. most of my stuff on the old one. I decided it was time. This thing's getting ready. I, I went back and I looked at every single blog post they had ever written about 19H1. And I did put that in my list of things that they, yeah. it's because it, it's so innocuous, right? Um, right? There is a, if you look at Windows 10 today, like the shipping version of Windows 10, and you have Pro, you'll see three major options under Windows Update. Change active hours, view update history, and advanced options. In advanced options, there is a, a setting for pausing updates, and you can set how long you want that pause to be. The only change they've made, according to their announcement, was they've added a fourth option to the top of that list that says pause updates for right. X days, at seven by default. They've made it easier for a normal person to see it and click on it and pause updates. That's all they yeah. said. I so know. I didn't take right. it to be a change of any meaning, you know, meaningful nature until yeah. I saw it in Windows 10 Home. Mm. So not only did they add it to the top level of Windows updates, but they added it to Windows 10 Home. Yeah, That's big news. Okay, now, can I ask you something about this, though? Yeah. Okay, so I think it is big news because they've been adamant in not letting mm -hmm. home users pause it. But does seven days do that much for you? No. So it, uh, right. so both of these problems <laughs> well, have an Not to be a Debbie Downer, but. No, you're right. 
you're, you're right. If, um, if a new Windows 10 feature update comes out, my advice to people, if they could, would be to pause that thing for 45 days, over a month. Right. What? You, yeah. you, want, you want to have time to make sure there aren't screwy problems. Because Even a week? But a week would be good. I mean, not wouldn't really, people know? Right? Well, no, no, not at all. I mean, imagine, uh, re remember what happened. Well, Windows, okay, so Windows 10. Uh, we knew within a week when 1809 was deleted. You think they'll be able to fix all the problems in a major no, feature no. update in a week? Well, they wouldn't be able to fix them, but but it, oh, I guess you're right. You need you to be able to say You can only pause it for never. seven days. Yeah. Here's, yeah. The well, here, yeah. here's the problem. Your, your computer is going to get that feature update on some schedule. You have no insight into when that's right. going to happen. Right. You don't know if you're part of the first wave, something that's going to happen in three weeks or whatever it is. So if you just heard that a new feature update has come out, you're like, oh, God, I don't want this. Pause it for seven days. Well, surprise, behind the scenes, that computer was never going to get it in the next week. Yeah. It's going to get it 13 right. days from now. You didn't pause anything. See, right. that's the problem with this. It, it This will pause cumulative updates, which are mostly what Microsoft calls quality updates, Those which are want. mostly made up of security updates, yeah. which actually you want. <laughs> so yeah. I, I, yeah. My, anyway, my point is, yes, it's a step in the right direction. I, I wish the range, because you can actually set it from one to seven days. I think the reason they put this here, because they're oblivious to this complaint we just made, has to do more with, um, I'm working on a really important project, and I just want to make sure that my computer doesn't reboot, mm -hmm. well, I'm, you know, because I'm leaving all these documents open. And that's not the, pro well, it is a problem, but it's not the problem. So yeah. I like that it's there. It, I see it in Windows 10 Home on multiple computers. Um. I, they could wipe it out. It may not be in the final version. I don't know. But right. step in the right direction, not the full solution to the problem. But remember, to this day, there is no official control in Windows 10 to pause updates in Windows 10 Home at all. So it's yep. still an improvement, albeit a minor hmm. one. Hmm. So the second one <laughs> is my personal pet peeve these days in Windows 10. I was so it's happy the, to see this. Oh, my God. The Cortana <laughs> screeching and scatting. I freaking hate that. Her, I, I, it's unbelievable. I can't tell you how many times. This is when you're installing Windows, the first yeah. time, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it, or you could reset it, like do a reset right. this PC because it's a fresh install. So the computer's over there doing its thing. I'm playing a video game maybe or working on a different computer. And all of a sudden, hey, blah, 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 and it's like the, it's like the <laughs> loudest, most obnoxious terribleness. And it's it, I jump out of my skin every single time. Uh, it's done in the name of accessibility. Uh, that's a crock, by the way. I've already written about this extensively. I don't want to go into that too much. But the extens accessibility at any cost is, is just a brain dead mentality. And they need to get over this. But OK, mm. whatever. So I don't mind it being an option. The way what I um, mind is that it happens at full volume without I any agree. opportunity to stop it. The way it also, happens by the way, on Apple is uh, it yeah, times right. out. If you don't do anything after a mm -hmm. while, it will then do mm. it. Yeah. Um, would that be okay? Yep. That's be the better. solution I provided yeah. to Microsoft. That's how they should handle it. That's exactly what I've said. Um, it's also nonsensical, you know, because the problem is most, like I run into it a lot. Most people will run into it once. So it just scares the crap out yeah. of them. The problem is, so you look at the computer now, and you're like, how do I turn this off? And mm -hmm. at the bottom of the screen, there's a speaker icon. And you're like, oh, good. You click that, it doesn't turn it off. You have to click a <laughs> microphone icon. Yeah, yeah. I, it's, it's, it's nonsense. Wrong. Like, it's, 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 it's nonsense. Anyway, so this is another one with a caveat. They are going to turn it off. Not for the reason I decided. <laughs> not even close. And... Not for Windows 10 Home users. Oh, what? Here's why. Guys, here's what they're doing. Windows 10 Home users are the guinea pigs. That's how they see us. You know what? That's a really friendly way of saying what's really happening, <laughs> right? Because it's not because it, you're just getting screwed. Like by virtue of the fact that you bought a computer, no one even thinks about this stuff. Microsoft has arbitrarily divided the world into Windows 10 Home and Pro. The PC maker will choose the appropriate operating system, usually based on cost. They'll choose home, unless it's a business class PC. And then you just get screwed <laughs> as the user. You can't pause updates and you can't shut this woman up. Like it's this digital assistant. It's it's unbelievable. Like it's terrible. And so here's why they're doing it. <laughs> it's just unbelievable. It's funny in a way. But now imagine my, my problem is me, although I've done it with multiple PCs too. Let's say you're in IT. And you're provisioning a ton of Windows 10 computers. 
um, all at once. And all of a sudden, this voice starts kicking in all over the room. There are great <laughs> videos of this online, by the way. It's hilarious. Um, they've addressed, that's the feedback they're addressing. And that's why it's only getting turned off in the business versions of Windows 10 Pro, Enterprise, and I think Education. Um, step in the right direction. <laughs> you know, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, geez, do I, 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 they just are not listening on this one. <laughs> Probably because they're deaf, because <laughs> Cortana <they're> deaf. So. <laughs> yelling. <laughs> when they, you know, when they first added that, I was like, you know what they're doing? They're looking for reasons to prove Cortana has a reason to be around, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so they're like, hey, where, where can we integrate Cortana throughout the operating system and in apps and everything? And now it's just kind of like, okay, they're taking, they're separating search and Cortana. So this to me feels like, shouldn't you just make, you know, the more Cortana voice though, stuff? Like an opt-in instead of an opt-out. There's this belief, though, that anything you add that's accessible is a win. It's just a win. There's no, and I, they've told me explicitly, like, we've heard from people who love this feature. And I'm like, I'm sure you have. I understand that the 99.99 the whatever percent of other people hate it and that it's insane. The way you've implemented it is wrong. And, I, you know, no offense to people who can't see or see poorly and maybe want to set up Windows 10 on their own. But if your vision is that bad, the act of setting up Windows 10 is not a priority. Yeah. I mean, it, it's <laughs> it's something that is going to happen once, and you probably have someone else who can help you with that. Well, I, 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 it's, well, it's, I don't, I don't no, know if I disagree with that. But the point no, no, is... I'm not saying, no, no, don't get me wrong. It sh I'm not saying it shouldn't be there. Yeah. It shouldn't be the default. Yeah. <laughs> it's just... I. I how would That's you do crazy. it, though? Let's say you've got a blind user setting up Windows. They can't right. see the screen. They, it's too early for their screen reader to be on there. Don't they can't you, tell if it's ready for them or not. You should do what Apple does. You should wait. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. That's all. Yeah, and then start the speaking. speaking. And by the way, when you do start speaking, don't scream. Don't don't come out at 87% volume or whatever it is. What if you played a little uh, a jig... <laughs> A jig at a low low volume jig, dum -ba -da -dum -ba -ba -bum -bum. and then people can oh know, maybe look, get used to the look, idea that look, you're going to say is, something. The world's getting more accessible, so at, at some point maybe there will be a standard for this kind of thing. Yeah. There'll be there will be a little sound like that. There will be a yeah. prompt for people with vision impairment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I and that I know exist that, today. And we I'm sure everybody knows, but if not, Paul is absolutely. Uh, uh, religious about accessibility. This is not you saying, "Oh, I don't want My accessibility." My son is deaf. Yeah, <laughs> I am. This is not. This I am is not, part of this community. Yeah, what I'm telling yeah. Microsoft is, you are not doing this right. And this little jig jag thing that she does, her little scatting thing, is disrespectful to the very people you're trying to help. Not to mention annoying. It, it, a little bit of Wi-Fi here, a little bit of. What are you oh, kidding me? So annoying. Oh. <laughs> it's it's no it's it, it it is. I I don't even I don't understand. How any human being came up with this. It's crazy. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> sorry. I, I know I can go on and on about this stuff. But can I suggest uh, though, if they do a little yes. jig or a little jingle, they use the one yeah. from the French train stations. Because I just <laughs> <laughs> Yes. I just yeah, love the SNCF that. sound or whatever. It is. <laughs> yeah, the SNCF uh, in the train stations. I, I hang out that. in train stations just to listen to that sound, Leo. <laughs> I have too. that sound on my computer. <laughs> do you really? Yeah. Wow, I'm impressed. I love that song. Isn't it I cool? love that song. And then yes, some, love it. some obviously gorgeous French woman comes on and says, yep. so, so by the way, all right, so now that you're into this, I, I will mention one of the things I've always noted, like if you ever take a train in like Boston or New York and the guy will come over the garbled ancient system. And this beautiful sounding voice, oh, man. this woman's voice comes off and says, in French, you know, Next stop, Cafe de Louvre. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, or whatever it is. And you're like, oh. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's awesome. You know? So good. Yeah. <sighs> so, Microsoft, Only the French. Austin T, and Apple is the Paris Metro. <laughs> yeah. There you go. In a nutshell. Yep. Yeah. Just a little, you know, a little something. You could start low, ramp it up. I'm going to make noise now. Dum, yeah. dum, no reason, dum. Noise. By the way, people who have vision problems are hypersensitive yes. to sound. Yes. That the loudness of this thing must be even worse for them. Yes. I yes. hear normally and it drives me crazy. Yes. I, 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 it's disrespectful. That's 
period. Yes. There's no I, there's no way to argue. It feels otherwise. like, and maybe this isn't the case, but it feels like an ad, frankly. <laughs> it feels right. like they're putting an ad. It's like how TV ads are louder and they're just Extra annoying. loud. Yeah. yeah. It just feels like they're sticking an ad in at the beginning. I know it's not exactly an ad, but it kind of is. Like, kind of is an ad for how jolly Windows is. Like, let's find the guy that made that dancing schoolgirl commercial and see what he thinks we should do for accessibility. <laughs> like, that's, that's, it's like, it's that stupid. Yeah. Yeah. I can't ever stop complaining about this. They, they literally, it's just a blank. They're like nothing. But it's accessible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's what it's done. Okay. Okay. Be happy. They they listened. They it's Not a, little, they a little bit in Windows. No, they listened Pro. to the IT so complain. Guys are posting videos on YouTube of There's this Cortana. Wrong with listening thing. to an IT pro. Come well, on. Imagine if well. you're installing 30, 30 copies of Windows <laughs> yeah. on thirty machines. Right. They all wake right. up and they all start yeah. at yep. different yep. times yeah. saying it, it, right, they're all off from little, each other. Little, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Might as well do jazz hands. <laughs> hey, hey it's, it's windows. <laughs> you have to yell at them. <laughs> uh, okay. There are, did you talked about the builds? No. Uh, uh, all right. When the, so there's two new builds. Leave Let's, that one to Mary Joe so my blood pressure can go yes, down. Paul's. I know. He needs to calm down, right? Yes. Uh, um, <laughs> so the features Paul just talked about. The, sh the silencing of Cortana in the Enterprise Editions and seeing more clearly that Windows Update is part of Windows 10 Home, that was in a build. That was was that the one that came out right at the start of January? I think. Yeah, it is. Uh, that was the yeah, first sure. build of January 18309. Um, so that build came out right when everyone came back from Christmas. That build also included. Some new things around passwordless account sign-in that Microsoft had foreshadowed earlier in a previous mm -hmm. build. Uh, so that's in there as well. And then today we got 18312. 18312's main noticeable new feature is going to be reserved storage, which I think it's funny. Paul put in the show notes, non-controversy of the week, reserved storage. <laughs> I, Based I on my Twitter feed... <laughs> This seems to have yep. become a very controversial feature. <laughs> so it's it's a it's a well-intentioned feature. Reserve storage is Microsoft saying they're going to reserve about seven gigs of disk space, but possibly more, so that in the future, Windows 10 feature updates can be installed smoothly. Because some people know who have storage constrained devices, sometimes you get you start to download one of these feature updates and it can't fit on your machine and it's havoc. So their their way of solving this is they're going to retain some space that will be held as reserve storage so that you can more easily download these feature updates. I wonder, um, can I ask you a question? Real, I don't know if you know this. Sure. I didn't look at this too closely yet, but um, yeah. what, one of the issues you can have in Windows 10 is you download an update and mm -hmm. it, it downloads, it goes, it says preparing to install, it says installing, yeah. and then it says restart. And then it goes to that, you know, you get the blue screen with the little thing yeah. and it's doing whatever it does. If that doesn't work for some reason, like that, that actually just happened to me on this very computer, yeah. mm -hmm. and you have to go back and reinstall it and, and try again, you actually have to re-download the whole update again. It doesn't oh, actually do? wow. retain it. <laughs> yeah. And oh, I, I've always kind of wondered about that because why wouldn't yeah. it just be sitting Somewhere. on your computer? But it, what it does is it 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 says we're going to put your, your computer back the way it was, yeah. and part of that involves getting rid of the update you just downloaded. So you're wonder wondering if that will is, reserve storage. I wonder. Fix I mean, I'd like that. it to stay there. Why wouldn't it just yeah. stay there? I'm not sure if it will. Um, but what okay. they've said is this will definitely be something for 19H1. This they're not even yeah. saying this might be it or might not. It will be. They're saying reserve storage will be introduced automatically on PCs that come with 19H1 pre-installed or on PCs where 19H1 is clean installed. So that's when it's going to start rolling out. So if you got today's build, the 18312, uh, you the way you can test this feature is first you have to do a quest through the Windows Insider program. So once you perform this quest, then you'll be able to test this feature. And there's a link in their blog post to what the quest is. Wait, what do you mean quest? Like go save Zelda? <laughs> what? Yeah, like save Zelda and then you can test reserve storage. 
I what? was wondering if that word was going to go unchallenged. What? What? No. So, you know, in the insider program, Where's they Waldo? have these things they call quests. And basically it's, it's a um, sequence of things they want you to do to help them test something specifically. That's what it is. Okay. So if you want to, if you want to test reserve storage, don't download the build first, do the quest first, then download the build. Or if you don't accidentally and you download the build first, you're going to have to wait till the next build to test reserve storage. Now, if I'm a seeker, works. should I not do a quest if I'm a seeker? <laughs> I, by nature, if you are a seeker, you are on a quest. That is the quest. You're on, you're on a permanent quest, then, aren't you? <laughs> a vision quest, maybe? Oh, my God. Yeah. They're trying to make it sorry, fun. I understand. Sorry I threw the word quest in no, there. Yeah, I, it's I feel like, like the, the inmates have taken over the asylum. Yeah, gamification of everything. You're, you're there are quests. Um, there's also in this build that came out today some new things around the Windows subsystem for Linux command line. They've added some more manageability features to that. So if you're somebody like Leo who cares about that, you might want to also check out today's build. And they're letting you, um, well, not letting you, they're making reset your PC options clearer across devices, they say, through some UI tweaks in today's build as well. So that's 18312. I haven't that came um, out. tested this because you have to do a clean install to see it, but the, mm -hmm. the passwordless sign-in is really interesting because it's possible now, apparently, to create a Microsoft account that only has a telephone number. Right. Um, and, or you could have a, a phone number associated with it. And then you can go into a new Windows 10 install and just say, here's my phone number. <laughs> you know, oh, and then it interacts with your phone in some way. And you say yes, or you type in a code oh, or whatever. Like and that, then you're in. Actually, that's not bad. It's, yeah, it's really smart because, you know, when Microsoft first started talking about getting rid of passwords a year or two ago, I was thinking to myself, like, well, we're never really... How are you going to do that? Never really going to be done, right? Like, right. Yeah. you know, if you're on, like, an <laughs> Apple device and you can usually use Touch ID or whatever, and then every once in a while it will say, this time you got to use your password. Or you yep. manually exactly. reboot your phone yep. and it says, okay, but this time you have to use your right. password. Yep. Um, I, always, I always think of stuff like that. I think, how are they going to overcome mm. that basic, mm. you know, issue, right? So, so it's should, interesting to see should, them... Should one use a phone number now? Is there... Does that mean I create a new... I, uh, no, what? no. So you should, no, you should be able to associate. I have number. my number associated with my Microsoft yeah. account. So it would is just, this really secure though? Using your well, phone number this way? SMS is not super secure. It's no right. It's secure ish. Probably secure enough in most cases because you know someone yeah. have to target you and hijack your SIM and all that. But it happens. Well, okay, but all right. So if, 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 as a consumer, is anything you do really all that secure? Oh, Probably yeah. not. I, I think. Right. I think what this is really for is for businesses because they will have management on the phone to ensure that you have a secure PIN or password or whatever it is to get into the phone first, and then you'll be able to provide the what is essentially a second factor or whatever because you're you're in. It knows it's you. You mm -hmm. know. I think that's what this is right. really for. Yeah. Um, now, as consumers, we will do dumb things to make life easier, and we can probably circumvent some of the security of this. But um, I don't know. It's like using a pin on a Windows laptop, right? Is a pin really more secure as as secure as a password? No, probably not. No. But I don't it's care. Secure enough. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. It's it's secure adjacent. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's it's you know I I I would much rather see someone have a well, that you have to have with the Microsoft account, obviously. So you, if you have a whatever your Microsoft account password is, you don't want to type that in every time you sign in. So the pin is nice. And then, of course, mm -hmm. if you have a fingerprint or face or um, God, I almost called a face ID. Uh, Windows Hello Facial Recognition. Um, you know, that's great, too. As far as being convenient. Yeah. So, yeah, that's all to say about those belts. You know, they're they're getting close to finalizing this uh, 19H1 because they're they're doing a bug bash at the end of this month. And we think this will be called 1903 when it comes out, which means it'll RTM, in quotes, in March and start rolling out in April. So they're getting close to this being finished. Yeah, and that's kind of why I decided to finally jump on board Um because I got to start looking, you know, I can't just ignore, you know, the next version yeah. of Windows, obviously. Um, 
So I've been looking at it. But, you know, that password <laughs> list thing we were just talking about, that's actually really interesting to me. So I'm curious mm -hmm. to see how that changes the sign-in experience if you can make it work. So I'll, I will test that. I, I mean, I, right now, the if you have the Authenticator app on your phone and you set up a new yep. Windows and you put your Windows account yeah. email, it'll do that. And I love that. And that's actually more secure mm. than SMS. That's a, that I, it, to it, my knowledge, that's secure. Well, um, if you don't have a password on your phone, though. Um, well, that's right. And somebody has right. your I phone. Mean, I mean, so, but that's what I mean by, you know, as consumers, we will sometimes make dumb decisions that kind of uh, chip away at the security. But I really think that this stuff, look, all you can do is control what you can control. And so for businesses, they're going to want to have the, whatever the management service is interacting with the phone to ensure that you have a secure pin, that it changes over a period of time, that, you know, they'll ensure that it's you. And so this is a nice, you know, this makes it much easier on people, which is the goal. But you want to, but also, well, maintaining security, at least in a managed environment. Yeah. Okay, good. Do you want to talk about Windows 10 on ARM? Oh, God, not really. Me um, neither. Okay. So, um, <laughs> no, it says this really matters. Somebody, somebody no, put I just, that I in just here, real Paul. quick, I don't want to go off on another extended rant. Or do I? Mm. No, I don't. No, but, you don't. Um, Where's the gong? Hold on. <laughs> Get the gong. No, I, uh, there is, by the way, there is an interesting question in our world, right? If, you, if we talk about Intel moving to Ice Lake and... Uh, 10 nanometer, uh, smaller devices, fanless devices, more powerful devices, better battery life. What's what's the point of Windows 10 on ARM? And it's a good question. I I think there's a reason. Well, I know there's a reason. I mean, Microsoft doesn't want Intel to have a monopoly on this stuff. So uh, Windows 10 or Qualcomm or Windows 10 on ARM uh, helps to push Intel to make the right decisions for their own chip to designs, chipset designs. And I think we're finally seeing that uh, happening in Ice Lake. So I, I've always said, like, if, look, if this thing fails and what it did was at least inspire Intel to get better about connectivity, about portability, about battery life, it's still a win for everyone, right? Like, to the average consumer, who cares what the architecture is as long as everything runs, the performance is great, battery life is great, connectivity is great. So, um, you know, we'll see. I, I think it's kind of hanging in the balance here for them. Um, right now, the Snapdragon 850 is kind of what I would call a minimally acceptable kind of, you know, good enough computing experience uh, if you can overlook some of the compatibility problems. I think the next gen where they're promising Core i5 type performance is going to close the loop, at least on that part of it. And then the um, the compatibility is an ongoing concern. But, um, you know, Intel, for the most part, has really been shooting for lucrative but niche markets, right? Uh, premium computers, gaming computers, you know, they're really amping up the power Whereas I think most people, uh, Mary Jo and myself included, would be better served by something that ran fine, <laughs> you know, but got awesome battery life, had instant on connectivity, seamless uh, switching between cellular and Wi-Fi networks is required. Uh, I think that stuff's a much bigger deal for most normal people. And um, we'll see, you know, which one gets there. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, I think Windows 10 on ARM is important because it's helping nudge Intel in that direction. Um, I hope it survives. I mean, I think it's a it's a neat idea. Um, but you know, a year from now, we'll uh, we'll, yeah, we'll see what's going on. It's kind of funny on. because Intel did radios for Apple, and they were so slow compared to the Qualcomm radios that Apple slowed down mm -hmm. the iPhone. So there was a Qualcomm. consistent experience. That's right. Yeah, and um, so Intel's reputation, I guess, in this is not good. Sphere <clears throat> isn't good. great. Well, and then you look at the, even just the PC space. If you look at um, their low-end processors, you know, the Pentium Gold and Silver processors, the uh, uh, the Y-series stuff. Although, again, you know, right now, the very latest version, uh, Ice Lake is where this stuff is going to go over the top, right? Um, we've, we've talked about Surface Go a lot, for example, and this notion that, well, clearly they were looking at Snapdragon for this. The compatibility problems were probably the reason they didn't do it, performance too. Um what would it look like with a next-gen Qualcomm chip? It's a good question, but, you know, mm -hmm. it's probably even more likely it's going to be a next-gen Intel chip of some kind, right? We just talked about the Intel, what's the Athena initiative Athena. Uh, yeah. for 5G connectivity. Um, that device suddenly becomes really interesting, right? Because the problems with the Surface Go are performance and battery life uh, and size. Uh, and size, you know, whatever, they're probably not going to change the size. But these new chips are going to solve those problems. And 
you know, that the Surface Go 2, if it's based on, you know, an Ice Lake chip, for example, um, either late this year or early next year, it's going to be a different, it's a different ballgame, you know, so we'll, we'll have a different conversation around that. Hmm. Yeah. You know, the funny thing about Athena is, from what I've read about it is, even though it does target Ice Lake, it also does target low low power processors as well. So maybe they won't switch the processor family, but there'll be other things right. going on, you know. Um, but, but, it will be a, but it will still be more efficient, right? It will still be more will. powerful. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And Actually, better battery life. Instant on. I didn't look blah, at, blah, I didn't blah. look at your, I don't want to, I don't, I'm not screwing up your, any, yeah. So uh, this Athena thing, <laughs> Mary Jo will remember, was a code name in the Microsoft space. Right. Back yep. in the day. So back when Longhorn was still a thing uh, and WinHack was still a thing in its original form, every year there would be these prototype computers uh, that Microsoft would work on with a PC maker. And one year, it was one called Athena, and it was made mm -hmm. with HP. And it, was, um, yeah, it wasn't meant to be a that. shipping device, but it was um, meant to show PC makers how you could take advantage of some of the technologies that were never going to come in Longhorn. So that was really exciting for everybody. <laughs> Proof of concept yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. I think it was Athena. Yeah, I think so. it was Athena too. Something was codenamed Athena before. I was thinking that when I heard that. Yeah. Yeah, that's what it was. Yep. Also, okay, off the top of my head, this might be wrong, but it wasn't Outlook. The original version of um, Mail and News uh, that was in Windows 90 something, wasn't that Athena too? Hmm. Does that sound right? She's Remember, the it was, goddess it, of wisdom, so maybe. There were two separate apps. It was one for news groups and one for mail. And then they merged it into one thing called Mail and News. And it eventually became part of Windows Live Essentials, whatever that thing was called, Windows Live Mail over time. But a long time before that, back when it was still like standalone stuff, you had to download. I think Windows 95 or 98, I think the code name for that was also Athena. Trying to find it. It was called Internet Mail and News. Hmm. Because obviously those two things are related. Codename <laughs> Athena, <laughs> referencing Outlook Express. Oh, Outlook, well, that's Outlook, Outlook Express. Express. That's the thing I'm talking yep. about. Yeah, that, yep. yeah, that was uh, uh, Internet Mail and News became Outlook Express. Yeah. Okay, so you are correct. Yep. Ding, wow. ding. Very good. Also, wasn't it the name of a goddess or something? <laughs> <laughs> I believe it was the Starship nah. Athena in uh, Star right. Trek reboot. What was the Roman version of Athena? <laughs> uh didn't the Romans rip off yeah. every Greek god, basically? No, yeah. I think Athena is the Roman version. Oh, so what was the original What's Greek, the Greek version? Greek version. Um, I want to say Hera, but I can't remember. No, what no, is it? Hera was uh, Zeus's wife, right? Well, that doesn't mean she ain't Athena. No, it does, because Athena is Zeus's daughter. Minerva? Uh, Minerva, that's Athena that is right. the Greek goddess of wisdom. <laughs> oh, you're right. <laughs> Athena is Greek. Roman is Minerva. 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 That sounds right. They were syncretized. Syncretized? Yeah, well, that's my favorite word. I please explain. Um, <laughs> th a good example, the prime example, the place probably I learned the word is uh -huh. the Hagia Sophia in uh, Istanbul, which was a Christian church and then became a mosque. Oh. It's the merging of two religions. Is yeah, so it's like every religious building in Jerusalem is like that. Syn you know, they were. Yeah. Yeah, but um, actually, syncretized more means one is absorbed into another than one is replaced by okay. another. So maybe even okay. the Hagia Sophia isn't quite right. It's it's, uh, but there's a yeah, lot. The Romans of, just adopted the whole. Yeah, Greek they, thing. that's right. Yeah, and some say that yeah. in a way they were the Christmas, Microsoft of the ancient world. Uh, yeah. You know, <laughs> yes, embrace, engulf, and devour. <laughs> yeah, that's what it means. I should have just said that. Oh, you know, syncretization. It's engulf and devour. Oh yeah, yeah, that thing. Yeah. These days, that's an antitrust problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they didn't have that in those days. Um, hmm. All right, so nice. Um, next non-controversy of the week. Yeah, we already did that one. Okay, uh, so there, that's it. We're done no, with non-controversies. Let me Citrix. Okay, let me Citrix. say something about yeah. Citrix. Yes. Um, so this week there was a conference for Citrix resellers called the Citrix Summit, and. It was funny because there were no Microsoft press releases coming out of this, though they talked, Microsoft execs there actually talked about Windows Virtual Desktop. If you've been following along with that, Microsoft announced that product at Ignite. It's the service they've got 
that's going to virtualize mm-hmm. Windows 7, 10, Office 365 Pro Plus apps and other third-party apps by running them in Azure using a virtual machine. So it sounds pretty cool. Um, the I forgot, but the public preview of that was supposed to be out calendar t- t- uh, 2018 before the end of it. It's, it's still nowhere in sight. And at the summit, Microsoft execs told attendees that uh, the virtual Microsoft Windows virtual desktop will be out in Q1 of this year in public preview. Um, they told them a few other things about how Citrix is going to fit in here. They they said, you know, even though many people think because we're doing this service, it means we're cutting out partners like Citrix, we're not. And we're actually doing a partnership with Citrix to make them integrate very tightly with what we're doing with Windows virtual desktop going forward. They didn't give any more public details, but I think they gave some NDA details that I don't know, but I'm working to you, try you and to I at, at different times <laughs> have both expressed this belief that someone at Citrix has something on Microsoft because I know. <laughs> the, the fact that Microsoft has not wiped out this company like 20 years ago makes no sense. And in fact, no sense. Microsoft co-sells Citrix products and they have yeah. made them part of the way that they recommend many enterprises do virtualization. Um, so, yeah, there's something definitely interesting and weird going on there. Remember, there was a whole Microsoft uh, virtualization product that they folded mm-hmm. so that Citrix could start selling Zen Desktop and a couple other products terminal, in its place. Was it terminal, <laughs> something related to terminal services? It was like a... Yeah. I don't know. If Maharo this, was the code name of that. Yeah, um, it wouldn't time, make sense. This is because of it, but Citrix. Remember Ed Yakobuchi, who was at IBM yeah. and founded Citrix, mm-hmm. was part of the IBM team that went to Microsoft, went to Redmond to do NT. Remember they swapped, and NT engineers went to IBM. Oh yeah, through You're from OS two days. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> and yeah. Ed was part of that, and then went on to yeah. found Citrix and. Yep. I'd always thought I knew Ed. He's passed away since, but he's a great was a great guy, really yeah. great guy. I always thought that because of that, Ed knew more about the internals of NT than many people. Well, he, and what he might have had was internal messaging about how Microsoft screwed over IBM for NT, <laughs> <laughs> and then maybe, maybe that explains maybe he had Citrix's some documents. Game, you know, <laughs> maybe we get the all access pass yeah. here for some reason. It, it really doesn't make a ton of sense. He does. I mean, they certainly had knew what they were doing, I guess, but. Uh, but yeah, that's that was years ago. That was decades yeah. ago. So I don't know. Yeah. But there's still a really tight relationship between those two companies. So tight that Gabriella Schuster, who's the head of Microsoft Partner Initiatives, went and spoke at this summit. Yeah. Um, Do you think so Citrix, uh, still- maybe Microsoft has a stake in Citrix? I yeah, don't. maybe. But <laughs> I mean, well, mm-hmm. like here's for example, like. Um, one solution to this problem would be Microsoft could just buy it. Could have bought Citrix at any time, right? And just kind of integrated that. And it would have been a term that just kind of disappeared, but its technology would still kind of just be in there. They never did that either, you know? Mm-hmm. It's really, this is, a, I, I, I believe this relationship to be completely unique in the history of Microsoft. <laughs> uh, I, think I, right, I, yeah. I don't have any other thing I can point to that's like this. I just think they incorporated, no like uh, RDP was Citrix or, or something like that at some point, right? Yeah, Maybe. yeah. Yeah, so I don't know. You no, know, but come on, yeah. you, you're telling yeah. me. Yeah, no, I know. I'm curious they never that's bought more, them. That's right? sentimental more than anything <laughs> right. else. Yeah, why didn't they just buy them? But right. why, though? A lot of people why, are like, why, why didn't they buy Citrix? You know? <laughs> yeah, just buy them. Just put them out of their misery. It's crazy. They, they're an ongoing concern. Well, Citrix is not miserable. No, Thanks I don't to mean Microsoft, like that. Yeah. Citrix is happy. <laughs> yeah. Of course they are. But they're like the little fish on the shark, you know? Like, you don't, right. the shark doesn't really need them. <laughs> and right. it's just... <laughs> the thing they do is a feature of this bigger thing that Microsoft does. You know, it, it, it's something that could be part of the whole feature set. You're saying um, they're a barnacle. Is that a bar- what you're no, 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 those little <laughs> fish, you know, that kind of, they, they wait for stuff to follow the shark's mark. Oh, so they oh, can oh, eat like it. a lamprey eel or something. No, what is yeah, that? So they kind of suction onto the yeah, side of the yeah, shark. Yeah, yeah. And when the shark feeds, they eat. It's a symbi- eat. classic symbiotic relationship. Symbiotic relationship. Yeah, yeah definitely. Wow, that really shut it down. Yeah, it did. <laughs> I thought the Minerva thing was going to kill this. It's a Remora eel, not a lamprey. Remora, Remora eel. Um, GitHub is 
uh, I thought this was really exciting. And I, it was clearly a Microsoft move now that they've acquired GitHub. Yep. They've decided to give unlimited... It used to be, what, you had three repositories for free? I can't remember. There were all these limits on what you could do for free. Yeah. But they've expanded what you can do for free, which I think is cool. They have. I know. It, this was really interesting. Uh, so they yeah. say, Microsoft execs say, one of the most requested features was to take their free plan for GitHub and to make it so that people who were using the free plan could have private repositories for free. That was what they had before. It was like, if you need private repositories... Oh, you have to pay for those? You have to pay. Right. Oh, okay. Okay. And, okay. and everybody was like, wait, like, okay, so what about Bitbucket? What about GitLab? Right. You know, so why should I stay with GitHub? So right at the start of this year, Microsoft has taken one of the most requested uh, asks and said, we're going to make it free. So, and, and I've had people say to me, what if you're a commercial developer though? Can you still do this? Yes, you can. If you're, if you have three contributors or fewer on a project and you want to have a private repository, even if it's going to be a commercial product, it's free. That's pretty awesome. But Mary Jo, there must be a catch. Everyone's Is there saying, a GitHub the 365 catch? coming that we need to know about? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. No, you know, and they do have paid programs and, uh, the, with the paid programs, you get a lot more functionality, and there are a lot of people who are willing to pay for that for GitHub. Um, they actually did um, some somewhat simplify the paid plans as part of this announcement too. But the main thing is now, if you have a small development shop or a team and you want to use the free version of GitHub to have a private uh, repository on GitHub, it's free. You know who this is good for, believe it or not, is you, authors. If you're collaborating on a book... GitHub is actually mm. a great place to do that. Leo, let me let you in on a little secret. Uh-huh. The Windows 10 field guide is on GitHub. There you go. Oh, it is? Wow. And of nice. course you want to keep it private, at least until you publish it. I use command line tools to publish the book to LeanPub so they can Perfect. put it out to the world. Yeah. And if you were working with Brad or somebody else on it, they could have up to three people. That's that's a pretty good complement of people. Yeah. So you so pay you, for that. Do you, yeah, do you use the private repository thing? Or no? <clears throat> um, <laughs> somebody else somebody pays for it. Oh, yeah, uh, that's a good question. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. No, GitHub is a great way to, to do stuff like that. It's not just code. Yeah. It's uh, for collaborating on documents. And you can revert changes. You can. So I never, just, yeah, I, I don't really mention this. I just wrote this thing about, you know, here's all the stuff I install when I do a new Windows 10 computer. But actually, one of those things is, in, is GitHub. Do you, you use the, as I do on Windows, probably the... There's a Windows version of Git that gives you kind yeah, of yeah, it's um, command line utility. You don't do it, Linda, uh, the, L, the LSW uh, version of Git, probably. Yeah, so when you install it, you actually can choose whether you want yes, to use that's uh, it. Unix style or Win. Yeah, yes. so I do. Yeah, it's Win. It's all Windows. Um, it's 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 into my you know it's in my path. So yeah, I it's Git for Windows. Git up yeah, that's what I use. But if, if you're in a repository, which in my case is the folder where the document files are. Um, you can run git commands against it, you know, and publish to a destination, which in my case is LeanPub. And uh, yeah, it have it's a. You know, I guess I could have automated it slightly differently with a, I don't know, some kind of a no. But <laughs> you get or used but, to you get used yeah. to you know, git commit message da da da, mm -hmm. git push. You get used to that. It's very yeah, quick. It's very easy. Um, I think it's a good way to do. It. I actually use a private git repository. Not through GitHub, but through another service called Keybase, for okay. taxes, for not mm. just for co for coding, but also PGP keys, you know, stuff I want to keep secure and private. It's really great, uh, and Git is a great way to do it. Then every computer has it. Yep. Yeah. It's just it, you know, let's me work on the book offline. Then I can add all the stuff that yes, I've exactly. changed. Yep. I can commit it, and then I can push it. <laughs> and if you were working with another author. Yep. Would even be better because you know. Well, I do. I they're actually we. Well, I do work with two people in this, so um, I'm usually the only one in there. But um, <laughs> there, we do have two other. People. No, it's like it's like middle school uh, science projects. You're doing all the work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no, they do a different. We're actually. I mean, Raphael does a lot of work uh, yeah, on the yeah. technical side, okay. and Martin does all the graphical. Yes, stuff, it's so. perfect. Yeah. So thank you, GitHub. Uh, do you think they? I think there was such a push against them when Microsoft bought them from yeah. the open source community. I think that's gone now, though. Don't you? I hope so. I, you have to have not been paying attention to what Microsoft has done over the past couple of years to, to feel any animosity to them at this point. 
there was just so much bad history, though. I think it. I think it's yeah. largely gone, but not totally gone. Like it, it, this when is, I wrote about this GitHub thing, there were people who said, "Yeah, but still, you know, they're going to be looking at what you put in there." But oh, who you're on. acting like it's this amorphous they that is somehow this entity <laughs> that know. has existed through time and space. You know, right. I always use this example because it's kind of extreme, but it's like I still don't like Germany because of the whole World War II thing. It's like, guys, those people are different. <laughs> they're right. not the same. Right. You know, it, it's uh, my, the Microsoft of today is not the Microsoft of the Halloween papers or whatever time frame you want to go back to. The Linux is a cancer days or whatever. Cathedral that and the bazaar. <laughs> yeah, the bazaar. Yeah. Um, you know, those days are over. <clears throat> you should love that. And, you know, because Windows 1, too. No. <laughs> no, but, I mean, you know, we, we have to... You know, it's like the Apple was the Steve Jobs. You know, we have to get over the notion that for Apple to win, Microsoft has to lose, right? Another outdated notion. Um, you know, same thing for the Microsoft side. You know, we have to get over the notion that for Microsoft to win, that open source has to lose. Yeah. And vice versa. It's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Microsoft should make Surface branded wireless earbuds, says Mary Jo Foley. And maybe they are. What do you know that we don't know? Yes, Mary Jo, please. I'm curious us. what I know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't know what she knows. Uh, it's a Rumsfeld. I, all I know is I've heard a rumor from a guy named Paul Thorat that there oh. might be some Surface well, branded. Yeah. So, earbuds. what does Thorat know? I when <laughs> at the fall, I guess it was October event where they announced all the surf, the new Surface hardware. The only actual new device they announced was these Surface headphones, right? Which are yep. These kind of enormous over-the-air uh, Bose-style noise-canceling headphones, right? And they're nice, but listening, I w I've been trying to go back and find a recording of how he described them because Microsoft has only released little pieces of that event, and this is not one of them, at least not that I could find. But I believe, as I recall, the way he said it was, you know, a lot of modern offices, the office walls have come down, people work in different spaces, and, you know, people be on the phone or talking to other people, and you want to kind of shut them out. And so you kind of put on these giant can things, and uh, that's how you do it. And that's why we built them. And I was like, eh. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> I, I, some people, some people might want to do that, but it seems like, you know, those kind of in the air things, uh, noise canceling, like Bose actually makes those as well, might be a better choice for a lot of people. And that these, when I look at these headphones, I look at them and I think like these would be, these would be really good gaming headphones, right? I'm actually surprised they don't make an Xbox branded version of these things, you know. So, so anyway, can, would I, you need would you need a special microphone for it to be a gaming headset, or could you use some embedded microphones that are in the headsets? Yeah. Um, well, they right. That's a good question. Um, I assume. Uh, do I should I assume? I don't know how that would work actually. Right now, yeah. I've only used wired headphones with an Xbox uh, through the controller, but it's one of those kind of small headphone cables. Mm -hmm. I don't even know if this has a headphone cable. It probably doesn't, but. They could certainly make a version of it that would connect to the controller. You could make a new version of the controller if it already doesn't support that, uh, that does Bluetooth for audio. It does already have Bluetooth. Maybe it already does. I don't know. Um, obviously, this does have a built-in microphone. Actually, a microphone array of some kind. It's like eight of them, right? Or something yeah. crazy. Well, because yeah. Of, yeah, because of directional sound, whatever. But um, I would much prefer, and I think a lot of people would prefer earbuds wireless earbuds and noise canceling and microphone and all that stuff. I just think that would make more sense for the, for surface. Like I look at these, I think this should be an Xbox thing, not a surface thing. And, um, or at least an Xbox thing and a service thing. So I published this thing. And then like within a day, I actually heard from someone who said, <laughs> someone I trust who said, well, it's interesting that you wrote this because uh, they are, in fact working on that. So, mm. um, <laughs> apparently someday we may in fact get the surface earbuds of my dreams. Okay. And so, why That's, wouldn't they I guess work the, on it? You know? This is a high profit margin uh, area, by the, the way. I think the, they make the, a, what I'd heard companies make a lot of money on this stuff. Yeah, like if well, they're expensive. I mean, yeah, um, and they don't cost much to this, make. Right. If this works as a product, if it sells, I expect there to be an explosion of surface peripherals. That would and be I've, great. I've, frankly, I've never quite understood why they haven't done far beyond just the basics. You know, mice and keyboard covers and so forth. I think there's a, a healthy market for Branded things, like you know, what? Like, like, like this what is else? bowling shirts, hard drives, <laughs> oh. dongles, uh, <laughs> okay. two of two of you know, like the um, Yoke, uh, YubiKey style. Oh yeah, security. That's yeah. a hot like all kinds item. Of yeah, you know? monitors. 
Yes, please. please. Monitors. Surface Maybe Studio price. monitor. Mm-hmm. Please. Yeah. You know, I looked yeah, at that I Lenovo build, building surface. Building out the family would be kind of, would be cool. I looked at the brand. Lenovo Surface uh, Studio clone. It's ugly. Yeah. It's not, that's not a. <laughs> it uh, definitely doesn't look like the Surface no, Studio. it's not elegant. Right. Um, it's a shame there was no Xbox news at CES. Or was there? What's that? Xbox? Or was it even a shame? Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, okay. All right. All right. All right. You know, Just for that, I I'm kept this play. down to one Xbox story, this. but you know what? <laughs> the SNCF Jingle <laughs> Remix. You want that, Paul? I can I can arrange for it. That could be our new theme song. It should be our new theme song. I like it. Yeah. I don't want to get sued by the French national train systems, however. France love them. (laughs) Um it's funny, my my family knows of this particular affliction. Yeah. Um Xbox. No, so Xbox curiously, not really at CES. Um, but there have been some Xbox related news items in the past week. Uh, um, the big one is kind of goofy because it's just a, a look back at 2018 when Microsoft did not dominate the video game industry and cast Sony aside. But, the, you know, they for gamers and for people who have remained loyal to the Xbox ecosystem, it was really a neat year of expansion. And when you look at things like um, backward compatible, uh, compatible games, uh, Xbox Game Pass, like the and these things have just exploded, right? And so, the numbers on all these things have just not quite exponentially, but they've just gone up dramatically. And I think this is all just you know pointing to this future where again Microsoft becomes a uh, a cloud service provider for games, and it will work on whatever device. Much like Microsoft's applications now work on whatever device, you know that this is kind of the future. of This thing, and there are baby steps to take. You know, you can have. Um, cross-play between platforms. You could have games that go to Xbox Game Pass that work on Windows 10 and on Xbox One, but obviously the future is de- deploying this stuff at scale across different platforms. And I think 2018 was actually kind of a great year for Xbox um, based on my many hours playing Call of Duty, um, but also on the many things that they announced, you know, and the many uh, improvements to all of the services that they offer. So I, uh, I'm sorry, Mary Jo, but... <laughs> That wasn't bad. That was painless. That was okay. That, yeah. that was doable. Yeah. I mean, it was it was better than oh, I don't know. Well, this. there was some other stuff if I really wanted to <laughs> you know, push it. Wow. <laughs> Turns out there are quite a few SNCF jingle remixes. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> it's a no I mean it's you couldn't visit a station and not be like, huh. Oh. Yeah. That's kind of a cool sound. <laughs> they always do it right before they want to make an announcement, right? Yeah. So yeah, that sound a, yeah. indicates that you need to listen because some train's coming in or whatever. It's, it yeah, be. it's this is what this is what you hear. Yeah, and then the voice comes on and says, you know, the, the 114 from Lyon is arriving on, you know. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, tracked 14. <clears throat> Let's... um. Let's take a little break. What do you say? <laughs> and uh, we will come back. Let's slow it down a notch. Let's slow it down. <coughs> Time for the quiet storm of Paul's <laughs> tips and picks and Mary Jo's enterprise tip of the week. But first, on a rainy Wednesday afternoon, I want to tell you how you can send your computer to France while you're sitting at home or England or Germany or anywhere you want to go using... Yes, ExpressVPN. ExpressVPN is the way to eliminate geographic restrictions, to surf the net safely, securely, and privately. ExpressVPN is the best VPN out there, period. I could say that with confidence, not just because that's what I think, but it's rated the number one VPN service on Tech Radar. And by the way, if you go to expressvpn.com slash windows, You can get three extra months free when you sign up for a year. And a 30-day money-back guarantee. Less than $7 a month. Whether you're in a cafe or a hotel, wherever you're using Wi-Fi, 
you got to use VPN to protect yourself, protect your privacy, protect your data. And I know a lot of people use VPNs at home, too, because, you know, the biggest snoop is your ISP. ExpressVPN has easy-to-use apps, not only for Windows and Mac, but they also run on your phone or your tablet. So no matter where you are, you can be secure. They turn on with one click and off with one click. They secure and anonymize the Internet by encrypting your data hiding your public IP address. And, of course, ExpressVPN takes your privacy seriously. That's why they do no logging, and they operate out of a country where no one can get to them or something like that. Uh, it, it is absolutely the way to surf safely on Wi-Fi, to eliminate geographic restrictions, to use the Internet as it was intended privately and freely. Protect your online activity today. Find out how you can get three extra months free with a one-year package, expressvpn.com slash windows. I think sometimes people shop VPN price only. Big mistake. <clears throat> if a VPN is free or inexpensive, it's almost guaranteed that they're collecting your information and using it. Sometimes they even, I've heard of VPNs injecting ads into your traffic. That's, <laughs> that's not a good deal for you. And it's not a secure solution. ExpressVPN is. ExpressVPN.com slash Windows. They protect your privacy. They, they do not log. And even then, it's still very reasonable. Less than seven bucks a month. Plus three months free when you sign up for a year. The number one trusted leader in VPN. And by the way, in my experience, the fastest. The fastest. With 148 locations in 94 countries. ExpressVPN.com slash Windows. Yes, you can be in Paris and never leave home. Uh, Paul Therott, I think you, my friend, should give us a tip or a trick or something cool. I would like to be in Paris. I know. Who wouldn't? <laughs> bum, bum, bum. Um, <laughs> so uh, you may have seen the news uh, right ahead of CES. Uh, Amazon revealed via an interview that there are over 100 million electric-powered devices. Yeah. And then, of course, Google, Google came back it. with, oh, well, you have a billion devices. <laughs> yeah. um, th this is not as far apart as it sounds, right? Um, first of all, the, the billion Google devices are mostly phones, which right. may or may not be actively using Google Assistant. Right. Um, whereas the Alexa devices were specifically purchased by people in the form of a smart speaker, typically, so they could use the service. So I think these things are actually very close, and I think they're going to remain very close. But it's it, it's interesting to me when I think about platforms and the history of platforms. You know, you look at the PC, there was one major winner, and then this other minor player. You look at smartphones, there's this one major winner, and this other minor player. And when you look at uh, digital assistants or ambient computing, whatever you want to call that, it's not really working out that way. Um, and I, there are secondary players like Bixby and Siri that will remain po uh, popular just because they're based on smartphone platforms that are used by hundreds of millions of people. And it, what we've seen so far, and this is very different from, you could go back to the earliest days of Commodore 64 versus Atari or whatever. Um, it was always very difficult to support uh, different platforms, you know, and it's one of the reasons why you don't see multiple platforms of computers or phones or whatever. Um, but in this case, we're, we are seeing that happen. So I think when it comes to smart devices, whatever it is, smart thermostats, smart door locks, smart lights, you know, whatever it might be, uh, uh, car support, et cetera, support for online services, um, it behooves all of these companies to support all the major players. And so <laughs> regardless of the actual numbers, I, I would just say at this point, it's very clear that Google Assistant and uh, Amazon are both top tier choices. They're always going to be supported. And honestly, even even if you went with Bixby for some insane reason or with uh, Siri for an even slightly less insane reason, um, those things are going to be broadly supported as well. There's no doubt about it. So You didn't mention... Um, you uh... Yeah, so my final little uh, <laughs> coda for this story is that uh, there is one loser in this market, unfortunately. <laughs> oh, and dear. If, um, and it's Cortana, obviously. <laughs> You're um, not talking it, Viv here. This is... No, no. Uh, yeah. No, even Viv is probably fine. Um, no, it's it's my look. Cortana, I think, has a, a role to play within the Microsoft ecosystem, whatever that means, right? So, if you're for somehow or majority of your time is spent on Microsoft device, you know, Windows PCs and devices and so forth, 
Um, Cortana can absolutely, play, I should say software and services as well. Um, Cortana can play a role there. And actually, for now, it's a fairly unique role, right? Your Google Assistant doesn't have a lot of insight into this world uh, today. You know, and that may change. We've already seen the first steps toward that with integration. I think that continues, expands. I think that's the future. We're going to see a bunch of PCs this year that come with a lot of built right in uh, from the get-go. So I think the I think the the die has been set on that one. Unfortunately, for do you for have Microsoft one you guys. prefer? Or do you use both uh, Amazon Echo and uh, Google? No, Voice? I use Google Assistant uh, mostly. Yeah. So I have we have Chromecast all over the house. We have Google Homes all over the house. We have a smart display in the kitchen, and it's pretty much all I use. I do have a the the little dot like the previous version of the dot just for testing purposes. Um, but I really just use the Google stuff. But that, it, but that's not. I, don't take that the wrong way. Honestly, I, there are great reasons to go. Are you okay, Mary Jo? <laughs> no, it's me. <laughs> no, I agree with you. I think Google's assistant is um, easily the best, and and likely to get I better so. and better. Yeah, I think so too. Um, you know, I used Mary jo, for okay, a long time. Oh, I turned her off. I didn't want her to get. <laughs> oh, sorry. Get involved. Go ahead. <clears throat> yeah. What do you think about music, though? Do you stay with Google Music or do you go with Amazon? So within the Google it, ecosystem, yeah. it actually doesn't matter what service you okay. choose because you can just set whatever default you want. So I actually yeah. do happen to use Google Play Music personally, but I use it because I prefer it. Uh, yeah. The rest of my family uses Spotify. And so what is Spotify, though, right? I mean, yeah. So yeah. if you go to our one of the Google homes or to the um, the smart display, and if you were my wife and, and you say, I want to play whatever playlist, it recognizes her voice and does it over Spotify. Mm. Um, when I come out and I say I want to listen to music, it's it does it over Google Play Music. Oh wow, nice! Yeah, and you control yeah. that with the app. So, yeah. yep. yep. Uh, the only thing it doesn't do is iTunes, obviously. Mm. Or and I, does it do Amazon um, or no? I think Amazon I'm, Unlimited is really limited to the Echo. I'm not sure. I though. actually, I'm not sure that's true. But it may I, not be true. I, yeah. It, if it is true, it won't be true forever. And by the way, for whatever it's worth, not that this is like a big story for our show, but. Uh, I do think you're going to see iTunes <laughs> slash Apple Music appear everywhere. And uh, actually, I wouldn't There's be surprised. There's evidence of that. You know why? At CES, yeah. Samsung, right. of all people. It's uh, not just Samsung, though. See, it's LG, it's Vizio, yeah. it's Sony. All mm -hmm. put iTunes um, and AirPlay 2 oh, wow. in their yeah, TVs. Yeah. So I actually just wrote about this today. It's not kind of, it's not really a Microsoft topic, but this is an Apple, the company that hates to partner, understands that its little insular ecosystem is only going to get it so far when it comes to services. Um, its services business are a tiny percentage of its iPhone revenues. And the only way it can ever hope to compete is you have to have more entry points for it. Um, they want to launch a TV service. It has to be on your TV. It has to be on your Roku. It has to be on your Fire TV. I think those things are all going to happen. Um, and they've finally woken up to this. Um, this company hates to partner, but they've been, you know, obviously they're forced to. So Google uh, does not support here are the uh, it here are the music and audio choices. YouTube music, obviously. Google Play Music, obviously. Spotify, yep. Yep. Pandora, and Deezer. Yeah. So I bet that changes. Um, well, certainly Apple has become more open to the idea of being on other people's platforms. Apple I mean, is on that's Echo surprising. now, is it not? Uh, mm. Yes. Which so means why would you buy a HomePod, right? Well, why, that's a good question in any case. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> but... Well, it's just so stupid expensive. But, um, you know, they, Google I bought, has this thing. You know, for Henry, for Christmas, I really thought long and hard because he uses Apple Music. But he also, yeah. he prefers Spotify, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. And I got him a Google Home Max because... Yeah, because it connects to any Chromecast connected speaker. It sounds just great. Just as well as it... It's, yeah, it sounds, wonderful. in fact, some say sounds better than the HomePod. I certainly Spotify is, is fascinating to me because it supports multiple protocols. Everything. So from within yeah. the app... Yeah, you can choose from multiple different kinds of speakers. Yeah. I like um, that I'm, Google the list Home of speakers Max. I can awesome connect to speaker. for my phone is ludicrous. Yeah. Like so, yeah. when I go up and shave and clean up and stuff, I'll listen to a podcast or an audiobook, yeah. and I have to cast it to the speaker in the bathroom, and the thing <laughs> populates over time. So, oftentimes I'll hit a button, and then my wife will be like, "You're playing music in the kitchen again," or you know, like is it <laughs> like I hit the wrong. You know what I mean? Because it, it gets kind of up. Can it's, you do multi-speaker, yeah. Sonos-style multi-speaker audio? Oh, yeah. That's exactly what we do. So oh, I have nice. wonderful speakers out in the sunroom in my office and that room and in the kitchen. And we have a, a – it's a whole house audio thing. So you can choose the speakers. Like we have groups. So there's a Therat All or whatever. That's all of the speakers. So you say, uh, you say okay, sh you know, Googie. Um, 
listen mm-hmm. to um, Christmas, my, carols Christmas carols on Thoratall. On Thoratall. The whole house. house. The whole house. That's mm-hmm. nice. Yep. Yeah, it's nice. Yeah. I have to and say, way, I feel a little Chromecast ripped audio. off. Go ahead. <clears throat> Which sorry, I do. I, just, I love it, Chromecast audio. Chromecast audio yeah. <laughs> is $35. Yeah. I bought these studio speakers that are 120 bucks on Amazon. And I've got basically two sets that are not exactly the same, but basically the same. I mean, for the price of like a Sonos speaker, right? <laughs> like I'm kind of, you know, it's astonishing. I have geez, an ungodly number of Sonos speakers. And I've, at this point, I, it's I really like time them. to retire them, I think. I like them, but... Well, so here's the good news. Um, Google Assistant is, or Google, or Chromecast is coming to it this year, Google Assistant. And you'll be able to add them good. into a... Yeah. Okay. So I, I mean, they sound fine. There's no reason to replace them, but I can't talk oh, to them. They sound great. Yeah. You will. Yeah. You will. Um, it's Amazon like an added a Chromecast like devices. Uh, I would imagine. Look, Sonos <laughs> loves to sell these little gadgets that cost hundreds of dollars so you can right. like yeah. add something to a thing. I'm sure they're going to have a little bridge that will be like add voice to your existing Sonos 5 or whatever. Right. Um, they'll do it. I use it right now. Yeah. I use uh, Echo. I was in the bathroom shaving Co- coincidentally. Yep. And I will say to my Echo, uh, Echo play uh well in this case the daily podcast on bathroom sonos and right. it just plays it on the sonos so that's nice mm-hmm. that is nice yep. but it's a little yeah, bit convoluted exactly yeah yeah well i'll often just do it on the phone so if i'm up like a exact scenario i'll do it like i said i'll do it on my phone i'll i'll just cast from the app and right. then the speaker list populates and i choose the one i want and then i miss you know because it's so sonos has confirmed that they're the sonos one which i have and the beam speakers will support Google Assistant. Yeah, but if you look at this, they're actually also saying they're going to bring it to older devices. Ah, uh, that would be nice. That would be nice. Because the older, the Sonos one is the one that comes with the Amazon Assistant built yeah, in and yeah. voice control. Yeah. Uh-oh. I have that one in my closet, of all things. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have way too many devices. I have an also, Echo way too sp- large of a closet if it needs a screen. I have an yeah. Echo Spot. Oh, my closet is an Echo Spot and a Sonos one. Wow. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, that's kind of nutty. Yeah. I don't like to be alone with my shoes. Is that weird? <laughs> or apparently know. with your thoughts. <laughs> oh, no. Heaven <laughs> forfend. There's silence anywhere in the room. Um, and you also, Paul, not to yep. not to give you short shrift, have an app pick of the week. Yeah. Actually, I have three app picks. Uh, what? None of these are necessarily major, but um, we know that Qualcomm was working to bring uh, native browsers to Windows 10 and ARM, which we talked about earlier. And I actually missed this when it happened, but apparently starting in late December, there are nightly Firefox builds for ARM64 on Windows 10 and ARM. And that means you can get a native web browser finally that's not Microsoft Edge. Um, it's a little rough. Um, it, it's not the performance. I was, you know, I, the, the problem with running emulated 32-bit browsers on Windows 10 on ARM is performance, frankly. And you can do a real unscientific test like I've done, just like App Startup. And it takes several seconds to start these things up. Um, Firefox today takes several seconds to start up in, in native form. So it's not anywhere near ready. But if you're one of those hardy people who is using the system, you're still going to want to take a look at it. Um, and you can find that. Oh, I wrote an article about it on the site, but it's on there. Uh, you know, the Firefox download page where you go to advance and you just choose the different versions and they have... You know, the ones for really technical people, and it kind of goes down the list. This is the most complicated one of all, but there is an installer. So it's not like you have to do a lot of work, but you just have to find it. And then uh, just two updates to things that have been around for a while. Uh, Microsoft Edge on iOS picks up picture-in-picture support. So when you don't want that autoplay video on a website, you can get it when you're not uh, actually in the app now, too, which is really useful. And uh, OneDrive for Mac picks up file files on demand support, which is that awesome feature we've had in Windows uh, 10 since since when? Since 1709, maybe, or I think it was last year, or 1803. I don't remember, but um, files on demand is awesome. And, and I, I think I had said of OneDrive some time ago that I really got used to not having what we used to call placeholders, and I arranged my folder structure completely, like rearranged it so that I could just sync the small couple of things I needed down to PCs. And I've been using that for years now. But now with uh, Files on Demand, I can see my entire OneDrive, everyone can obviously, uh, right in File Explorer. And then you can just kind of mark the folders that you want to be always available offline. And now you can do that on the Mac. Nice. Well, there you have it, folks. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Now, for my flavored vodka pick of the week. I, uh... <laughs> we do need that one. 
<laughs> for her cruciferous vegetable pick of the week, here's Mary Jo Foley. <laughs> I like that. We should do that. We should. Um, my enterprise pick, though, not oh. vegetable pick, oh. is uh, Microsoft Teams. Because today, Teams got some more first-line worker features. I saw your article. I thought this was really interesting. Wow. So this is interesting for a couple of reasons. One is when we did our prediction show last week, I said one of my big predictions was Microsoft was going to make a lot of uh, push toward picking up first line workers with their products. I was right. Um, <laughs> this, <laughs> hey, I was right about wow. something. Uh, what? So today's announcement was um, first line workers who are people on the front lines, you know, like people at, who work at in hospitality desks at hotels, uh, hospital workers, manufacturing workers. These people are very mobile. They're always on the go. They're not sitting at a desk like information workers. So they added some new mobile features specifically targeting these first line workers. One of them is um, something they're calling smart camera because they know that a lot of first line workers, say if you're working in like a Best Buy or something, they go and take a picture of something in an aisle to show their boss. But they're sending these over these insecure channels using whatever happens to be on their phone for their messaging protocol. So Microsoft's idea is, hey, what if we could get it so that if they use their camera on their smartphone, it'll just save to Teams and not save locally to their phone. Then they can even use it for things like x-ray pictures if you're in a hospital and not be worried about compliance violations. So that's one of the features they're going to be adding to first-line worker teams configurations. They're also doing that for secure messaging. Same idea. Like if you're talking to your boss using your messaging protocol on your phone, it's not secure. How about instead if you saved it to teams or did it through teams so that you would have a secure environment that, you, that your bosses wouldn't have to worry about you possibly revealing information that, again, violates privacy or compliance rules. Um, so those are a couple of the mo uh, mobility things. They also have a, a feature in Teams that they announced at Ignite called Shifts, which is a feature for your boss to manage shifts of first-line workers and kind of keep track of their schedules. The idea there is Microsoft opens up that API so that if you have an enterprise workforce management product installed, Shifts can now integrate right into that through this new open graph API. And because everybody needs a little praise, Microsoft also is adding badges for first-line workers to Teams, trying to increase employee uh, loyalty and make people feel loved in their Teams. I said that with a straight face, but yeah, that's a I thing. So <laughs> We love our team. We love our team and we love our employees and we don't want you to quit even though we're paying you $10 an hour or whatever we're paying you. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, is that what first line means? First, yeah, Min first minimum line wage. <laughs> there are, you know, people who work unloved, in unloved restaurants, yeah, you know, yeah. um, fast food restaurants, uh, but also people who work in hospitals too. I mean, okay. like it's a wide gamut of what is considered a first line worker. Yeah. So all these things are either in teams as of today or coming in the next calendar quarter nice. um, and will be rolled out. And it's not a code name. This week it's a buzzword. Yeah. And this has been, I think, a buzzword of the week before for me. But I wanted to revisit it because it came up a lot this week with CES. The buzzword is partner. Microsoft no longer uses the word partner just to refer to companies like Citrix and like SAP and like Adobe. They're now using the word partner to talk about customers, too. So I don't know if you guys saw this uh, earlier this week. Microsoft had a partnership announcement with Kroger, the supermarket chain. And when I was reading articles about this all over the web, people were like, oh, this is how Microsoft takes on Amazon and Whole Foods and blah, blah, blah. Guys, you know what that Kroger deal was? It was a customer win for Microsoft. Kroger is paying Microsoft for Azure. They're using Azure Kroger is using Azure to build their own retail as a service product. This is not Microsoft getting into food distribution, getting into running their own food stores or anything like that. It's not It's not the same thing as Amazon and Whole Foods at all. Um, so because of the word partner, I think a lot of people are getting confused when Microsoft announces these deals. Another one that they announced at CES was around LG Electronics. They announced a self-driving car partnership. 
So again, people are like, oh, Microsoft's getting into self-driving cars. Nope, they are not. <laughs> they are selling Azure and some of their AI technologies to LGE, which is using them in self-driving car dashboards and other, other components. So word to the wise, when you hear partner, it might not be what you think. It might just be a customer win for Microsoft. But we're all partners in this. We're all partners. I'm a partner. You're a partner. We're partners. <laughs> and you know, partners in life. You know what partners partner in life, partner do in Windows Weekly. for other partners? Hey, partner. They buy him a beer. <laughs> yep. That's Paul's going to hate my beer pick. I'm going to take a beer today. I'm going to oh, hate this beer go. pick. Sorry. It's, I, it's got IPA in the name, doesn't it? It does. But <laughs> let, let me set this oh, up hold for on. you. Hold on. No, 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 no. <laughs> Oh, wait, I have the I have the perfect setup for this. Okay. As Azure Stack users know. <laughs> okay. Oh, Stop right now. <laughs> okay. Hybrid <Go> <laughs> computing yes. is a thing. Yes. Hybrid computing is a thing. Yes. So now are hybrid IPAs, people. Oh. Firestone Walker so. has a beer that they're calling Propagator Generation One, which is called a hybrid IPA. And the reason it's a hybrid is it takes the best of East Coast IPAs and the best of West Coast IPAs and combines them uh, into one. It's a it's a hybrid with itself. It's a hybrid. I thought it was going to be like IPA. a hybrid with some other kind of beer. No, this no. one is a hybrid IPA. But I, I was skeptical <laughs> when I read the description of this. But I have to tell you, it was very delicious when I tried it's it. It's more IPA. <laughs> it's even it's more not, IPA. It's not less IPA. <laughs> no, it's way more. It's way more. Because you get all the nice juiciness of the hops from one coast and the bitterness of the hops from the other coast. And you munch them together. And you just get this thing that's very delicious, smooth, 7.5%. So you could have more than one and still be okay. Um, so if you see it around, it's called Firestone Walker Gener Propagator Generation 1. And it's a hybrid IPA. And our chat room... Specifically, Webster wants to wish you happy new beer. <laughs> happy new beer. Thing? Happy nice. new beer. No, I think it's I a good know. thing that we should start it. So <laughs> I didn't realize which coasts uh, hops are bitter and which coasts hops are mellow. So, it's just like the rapper um, wars from the 90s. It sounds like it. Oh, you're is. Oakland style. A lot of times <laughs> West Coast beers, I think, are more bitter. Um, like have you ever had an IPA in Seattle? Those are like really like woof, yeah. hard, hardcore hops and bitterness. And New England IPA style is much more juicy. Okay. Kind of the opposite huh. of the way you would, might think. Yeah, of actually. The people, right? yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. <laughs> New England Based is. Based on my uh, understanding of the uh, cultures. Usually understand. a little flush, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. That's a great Windows Weekly. You just kick off uh, – our second episode of 2019, Paul Therott and Mary Jo Foley. You'll find Mary Jo Foley at her ZDNet blog, allaboutmicrosoft.com. You'll find uh, Paul at his website, therott.com. And Paul's books are at leanpub.com, including the Windows 10 Field Guide. Now out as written on GitHub. I know. I'm, I'm impressed by that and intrigued. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's my good. one little uh, <clears throat> attempt at nerddom, I guess. <laughs> That's pretty nerdy. nerdy. Pretty nerdy. Um, we do Windows Weekly every Wednesday, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, 19 or I guess 1800 UTC. If you want to tune in and watch, uh, the live feed is at twit.tv slash live. Actually, there's live audio and video. You have a choice of channels in both, so pick the one that works best for you. If you are watching live... On a Wednesday uh, afternoon, you should probably go in the chat room, irc.twit.tv, where the other five people who are watching live are also hanging. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's our, uh, it's our, uh, these are the, uh, the kids in the back of the class, the <laughs> commenting at us. Occasional, right, the spitballing. Occasional spitballs, yes. Mm -hmm. No, they're great. Uh, and it's, it makes it a lot more fun, too. Uh, if you can't watch live or listen live, I understand. I mean, obviously, uh, people have lives. But that's why we make everything we do on demand as well. At twit.tv slash WW, you can download every episode, audio or video. Uh, you can also, and I would encourage you to do this, subscribe at, uh, you know, well, just do it in your favorite podcast. Or you can go to twit.tv slash WW for a list. Uh, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Mary Jo. We'll see thank you me. next week. Where are you? Are you traveling anytime soon? We always ask at the end of the show. Oh, no. no plans? Yeah, no, thankfully. No. Nope. I know. A little we break have stuff from travel. in the spring uh, and summer, but so far, 
my schedule is clear, which is Alex so nice. Alex just wiped his brow. Alex got Yep, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> so it's weird to me that my travel is hard on Alex, but <laughs> <laughs> not as hard as on you. But it, uh, it's always uh, we always have to yeah. work work out the uh, technical details. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Mary Jo. Have a great week. We'll see you next time on Windows Weekly. Bye bye. <laughs>